Okay. I mean, the talk is entitled Seeking to Stand Beautifully on the Earth. And maybe I'll start with a hard saying. There are now 5,000 million of us on the Earth, 5,000 million human beings. And in our behaviour, and I want to stress the difference between our behaviour and our nature, because as we know, there are good human beings. Uh, there, there's great goodness in a lot of human beings. But in our behaviour now on the Earth, it seems to me that we are AIDS virus to the Earth. We're doing to the Earth exactly what the AIDS virus does to the human body. We're breaking down its immune system. But maybe people will say the Earth hasn't an immune system. I mean, the Earth isn't biologically alive in the way that we are biologically alive. But that is a great mistake, I think, the mistake we make of assuming that aliveness must be biological aliveness. I got a sense walking the roads of Connemara, walking up into the ground to do Keoig, that the whole Earth is a living planet. It is a living thing. And like the rocks are alive it is all alive and we are damaging it most dreadfully and most terribly and all you have to do is look at the headlines every day on the paper to see how badly damaging how badly we are damaging it now the question is like if this is so then we are into ecological disaster ecological breakdown and if we're into ecological breakdown we're into cultural breakdown now when in the west in our century an individual breaks down we tend to lie that person on a psychiatrist's couch and take that person he or she back to their infancy to see if there are any experiences there that the child or the infant had and wasn't able psychologically or psychically to digest i mean if i were to eat raw fish now Physi physiologically and anatomically I couldn't digest raw fish, I would have to bring it back. And the theory is that maybe children were exposed to some terrifying or terrible experiences when they were infants and they couldn't psychologically digest these experiences so what we do now is we lie them on a psychiatrist's couch, take them back to their infancy get them as an adult to remember that, that traumatic situation or or damage or experience, get them to relive it as an adult and, in a sense, be released from it. Then they won't afterwards be, be interfered with from within by neurotic symptoms or bad dreams or nightmares. Now, it isn't only an individual who breaks down. Cultures can also break down. And I think we are so far into ecological calamity now that our culture, even though the signs might be visible to us, like we're into cultural breakdown. And if I were to, just as you'd lie an individual on a psychiatrist's couch, I imagine lying European culture or Western culture on a psychiatrist's couch and taking it back to its infancy to see if it went off the rails anywhere back there. And I think it did. I think it went off the rails right at the first page of the Bible. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 28, when God is saying... Let us now make man in our image and likeness. And having made man in his image and likeness, he says, he gives him a command or at least a divine mandate to rule over the earth and to subdue it and to have dominion over the fish of the sea and the bird of the air. Now, when that got translated into my catechism at school, I mean, the first question in my catechism was, who made the world? And the answer was, a, sh a forest of hands would go up, God. And then the second question, why did God make the world? And another forest of hands went up. And the answer to that was, uh, for man's use and benefit, Benefit. Now, we don't know whether it was for women's use and benefit or whether it was whales' use and benefit or whether it was for dolphins' use and benefit or for the AIDS virus' use and benefit. But it was for use and benefit. Now, the, that phrase, like use and benefit, if one were to look back at the Earth from the moon, and we have seen pictures you know, taken of the Earth, this gorgeous blue jewel hanging there in space, like, and to say that that's just for use and benefit, in the, in the same way that a sink would be, in the same way that a toilet bowl is, is for use and benefit, that phrase use and benefit. And so this, from the word go, our attitude to the earth, our relationship with the, to the earth was all wrong. And here we have, a, we have biblical permission and an almost biblical command to be like that in relation to the earth. Now that doesn't survive in the Bible. It is again reiterated to Noah in chapter 12, I think, of the book of Genesis, but it is radically withdrawn in the book of Job. Job, you remember, you know, was sitting on the ashes with a potsherd scraping his, his sores, and he called on God to come down and justify, justify himself to man, in a sense. And God came, spoke to him out of a whirlwind, and God said, Gird up thy loins now like a man, and answer thou me. And God commands him, Behold now Behemoth. And he is told that he cannot and never will 
have dominion over behemoth. He will not and cannot have dominion over Leviathan and ostrich. All those tremendous forms which I made with thee. Now, as Christians, some of us might be worried about being in collision with your holy book. It isn't a bad thing to be in collision with your holy book, to be religiously in collision with your holy book. And a sense I have anyway is that the whole biblical tradition uh, into which, say, Jesus was born, that crossed the Cadron with Jesus into Gethsemane on Holy Thursday. And having crossed it, it underwent the same kind of purification that Jesus underwent. Uh, I mean, some Christians would balk at the idea of Jesus undergoing a purification. That would mean that he was impure. But I think the whole of the world's karma emerged into Jesus. So when Jesus put his hand on his, to his brow, like it was the whole of, he was Grand Canyon deep in the world's karma at that point in Gethsemane. And so he was sweating it all away. It was all coming to the surface. Phylogeny was coming to the coming flush with ontogeny in him. So that the Bible underwent an immense purification there. So that in Easter Sunday morning, we don't only talk about a risen Christ. We have to talk about a risen Bible. And it seems to me that the Bible as we know it isn't adequate at all to talk about a risen, the resurrection. We would need a Bible that was itself a risen Bible to talk about this stupendous event. So that if I were to say now, I mean, can I now be kind of religiously in collision, not not rebelliously, but religiously in collision with my holy book and say that I must for the sake of the earth, refuse now to be a carrier of those two of those two biblical verses to rule over the earth and subdue it. You can imagine, like, if I had a wife and my relationship with her was to rule over her and to subdue her and to have dominion over her, then, like, that wasn't a relationship where she could give, where she could manifest herself in the fullness of her and, and in the generosity of humanity to me. If I have a dog at home and I rule over that dog and subdue it, that dog can't allow his nature to be manifest to me. Now, if on the first morning of creation, God were to say, on the sixth morning of creation, God were to say to, 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 to the new creation, out there nature is stupendous, stupendous in its waterfalls, stupendous in its glaciers, stupendous in its storms, stupendous in its silences, stupendous in little things, stupendous in daisies, stupendous in little, in little snowdrops, stupendous in cows calving. Go out there into the great places and the small places because the small places are also stupendous and allow yourself to be whelmed and overwhelmed by nature. Allow yourself to be even terrified by it because as Blake said, remember what is it the roaring of lions the howling of wolves and the raging of a stormy sea and the destructive sword are portions of eternity too great for the mind of man you know but even though you will be encountering portions of eternity out there that are too great for your mind at least run out there and be go out there and be with them and be overawed by them or be be be, be impressed by them, to say the least. Like Then your attitude to nature wouldn't be one of domination. Your attitude would be totally different. So it seems to me that now it behoves us to no longer be a carrier of those beliefs about the universe into the earth. I, uh, into the earth. Because beliefs, beliefs aren't just, just movements in my mind that don't leave my mind. Beliefs are actions. Cromwell's beliefs about the Irish, they became actions in Drogheda. They became, his beliefs became vis visibly, they became visible as actions in Drogheda. Nazi, Nazi German beliefs about Jewish persons, they became, they became actions. So beliefs are actions. And if now in the 20th century I was to ask an astrophysicist You've been looking at the, at the Earth and looking at the universe for three centuries now through telescopes and microscopes. What is the universe? I would be told by an astrophysicist like Carl Sagan that it had its origin in a big bang and it's going to end in a big crunch. Now, how in God's name like, can I love something that had its origin in a big bang? I mean, just to listen to the phrase, big bang, like an explosion in the streets of Belfast, and that is going to have its origin, it's all going to collapse by some tremendous gravitational pull back into itself again, and that's going to be the big crunch. Now, how can you walk beautifully on something that's just an explosion in the streets in Belfast? How can you, how can you love that? You know, so 
We inherited in the West some beliefs, I think, that were hugely and are turning out to be devastatingly unfortunate. And in the 17th century, are people now looking back, historians of science will say the 17th century was a tremendous century, a great century, the century, the, the, the century of the great divide, maybe Whitehead would, would call it, uh, in, in his book The Adventure of Ideas. Now, that was a century in which Newton and Descartes and the rest of them would have, uh, would have elaborated their philosophies. Can I read you just one passage from Newton um, in relation to just what I'm saying? Because what happened was that our biblical beliefs from Genesis ch- chapter 1, verses 26 and 28 became united with this kind of statement. Can I just, it'll be very short, and it's in kind of 16th, 17th century English, so I hope you won't mind. If at any time I speak of light and rays as coloured or endued with colours, I would be understood to speak not philosophically and properly, but grossly and according to such conceptions as vulgar people in seeing all these experiments would be apt to frame. For the rays to speak properly are not coloured. In them there is nothing else but a certain power and disposition to stir up a sensation of this or that colour. For a sound in a bell or musical string, or other sounding body, is nothing but a trembling motion, and in the air nothing but that motion propagated from the object, and in the sensorium it is a sense of that motion under the form of sound, so colours in the object are nothing but a disposition to effect this or that sort of rays more copiously than the rest. In the rays they are nothing but their dispositions to propagate this or that motion into the sensorium, and in the sensorium they are sensations of the, of those motions under the forms of colour. Now, in this very short paragraph we have the phrase nothing but used four times. And reading them, I remember the first time I read that passage, I thought, Christ, they're, like, they're almost like the four horses of, of a scientific apocalypse. Like, we have now entered the nothing but universe. The universe is nothing but. I mean, a scientist now might say it is nothing but universe. Just as the children of Israel came up out of, were led by Moses, up out of the land of Goshen, up out of the land of Egypt, and they came into the terrible desert of Zin. And in the desert of Zin, they talked about it is no place of seed or of figs or of vines or of pomegranates, neither is it neither is there any water for us or our cattle to drink. And they talk about in it our souls are dried away. Now I think modern scientists have led us into a nothing but universe that is without colour, that was without taste, without touch, without all of these things. And I'm not denying that Newton isn't isn't is isn't right here. I mean what Newton is saying is so far so good. But like in, in lesser, in the hands of lesser persons, uh, and by the time we reach the 18th century, we are straight into the nothing but universe. Now, add that to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 28, and we have the formula for the modern world. Now, can I just tell you a story in relation to what, what I think has happened as a consequence of the molecule um, of, of, of interpretative endeavour, which was born out of the union of Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 28, and this Newtonian uh, or scientific view of the nothing but universe? It's a story out of Africa. I mean, the story goes that I think it was in, at the end of the 18th century or maybe the beginning of the 19th century, there was a plunderer explorer somewhere in Africa and he had amassed a huge fortune in merchandisable goods, wonderful African ivories and splendid carvings. Now, he was somewhere in the heart of Africa and he had to get them to the coast of the Indian Ocean to rendezvous with a ship that would be passing that way full of the third next moon. And um, so he hired the best African porters he could get, not just strong men, but he had to hire men who were happy because this was going to be a long journey. And one morning, having eaten, they were ready to assume their burdens and off they went singing their songs. And these were, it was a joy to be with them because they were happy and the spirits of their ancestors were coming with them and their gods were coming with them. And the next morning again, they assumed their burdens and off they went. And the third morning and the fourth morning, the fifth morning, these people were happy people. And they travelled finally out of their own tribal lands into other kinds of lands that were geological logically different and the vegetation was different and the animals were different but they were still singing and their gods were coming with them because the gods were in the songs and uh, after two and a half moons it looked as if they had made tremendous progress they had indeed made tremendous progress and they were going to be at the coast of uh, of the Indian Ocean to rendezvous with the ship but then one morning having eaten they didn't 
They didn't happily assume their burdens. Instead, they seemed to sink into some tremendous trance state within themselves. And this old plunder explorer began to be very upset and to get belligerent. And uh, finally, he took out a revolver and fired shots over them. But he was making no impression whatever on them. Because these people had sunk into some kind of trance state. Anyway, after a while, he wised up. And he sat down beside one of them and he said, what's going on? During the last two and a half months, we've made tremendous progress. Now what's happening? And it took a long, long time for this man, this black man to come out, this African to come out of his, out of his trance state, to come into a sense of his own hands and his own feet and a sense of his own identity as a person. But finally he did emerge into the sense of who he was and he turned to him and he says, I will tell you. We have moved so far, so fast during the last two and a half moons that we must now sit down and wait till our souls catch up. Now, it seems to me that during the last three centuries in Europe, we have moved so far, so fast that we really have lost our souls. And losing our souls is, according to the first peoples of the world, in the 19th century, if I was a 19th century anthropologist, I would call them the primitive peoples of the world, wouldn't I? I would use the word primitive, meaning that I was somehow superior and advanced. But let's call them the first peoples of the world. To lose your soul is the great calamity. Only the greatest of medicine men, only the greatest of shamans can handle that, can bring you back to be in touch with your soul again. We have lost our soul, and because we have lost our soul, we aren't able to see soul in anything else. And we have now arrived at a point like where the utilitarian thing, John Mill's utilitarian thing, but a universal utilitarian attitude to thing, use and benefit. That use and benefit attitude and uh, has has so taken over that right now our eyes are like brain tumours. Our eyes in the West are almost like brain tumours. You know, brain tumours of economic seeing. I mean, all you have to do is listen to the radio or listen to farmers talking down in Connemara, where I come from, like, and they will see a cow coming down the road, and that cow is just kilos of meat. They can't see a living being with soul. They see kilos of meat. I remember once in Banla Hinch, like, walking up by a wonderful salmon river, like, glorious, like, you know, you're being mirrored, and the salmon and the sea trout are running, and if you were there in the morning, you'd have seen the otters. And this is, and it's, it's, it's between two lakes, the stretch of the river, and it it is, it is, it is, like it gives you your soul. And if, like, if you were to say, I don't have soul, you could imagine the river saying, well, that's all right, I'll be soul to you, because the river seems to be liquid soul, just all soul. And it was May, and we walked under a great beech tree, and it was putting out, I suppose, a half million leaves, and I'm not impressed now by the number of leaves it might be putting out, like, but, like, it was, it was these green things, like, were coming out of it, and how astonished I would be if suddenly green wonders started coming out of my tongues, or coming out of my, like, coming out of my forks and knives, like, I would report the miracle to everyone, wouldn't I? But here, it, the green things were coming out, some great miracle was happening, you know, and I said to my, to the man I was with, I said, isn't it one Wonderful, you know, I use the stupid word like, isn't it wonderful? But that's the word I used anyway. And he looked up at it and he stood back at it and Christ said to his, there's about 300 cubic feet of timber in that one, you know. <laughs> now, like, when we've arrived at the point when we look at a cow and we see kilos of meat, we look at a tree and we see uh, cubic feet of timber, we look at the night sky and we see big bang and big crunch, then I think we really have come into a terrible Earth and a terrible universe. We have lost touch with soul in us. Therefore, we can't see soul. We can't see aliveness. We can't see anything more than biology. And if I were to ask a botanist or a biologist now, what am I? Like, you know, like I've asked the astronomer and now I'm asking a biologist, what am I? And I think I would, a Dobzhansky would say, you are transformed groceries. Like you've brought yourself home from Quinsworth or you've brought yourself home from whatever your favourite supermarket. Like you're just transformed groceries. You are what you eat and that's it. Like now, if I believe like that I'm transformed groceries and that the woman I love is just transformed groceries, how in God's name like can I ever write a sonnet to her eyebrow? Do you know, like that a Shakespearean sonnet to my to to, 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 to my love and lord and lady's eyebrow? Do you know, how can I ever write a letter to her and and have lots of X's and O's at the bottom? Like if I'm only if I'm only if I'm only throwing my arms around a, a, a shopping basket like of of supermarket groceries? Like do you know, I mean, wh- I mean, isn't it incredible the kind of talk? I mean, and like. People, people no longer believe that we are fallen. I mean, the doctrine, the Christian doctrine, and I'm not here now to preach Christian doctrine, but the Christian doctrine of the fall, we, we, we no longer accept that any such thing can have happened. All you have to do is listen to a phrase, the beef industry. Like, the beef 
industry, there in itself, like, is a symptom crying at us of the fall. The beef industry, and you can go on, the tourist industry is all like, do you know, we, we are in a terrible state. So if we are right, and if there's any chance at all for us and for the earth, then we must sit down and wait till our souls catch up. It is now shape up or shape out time. A tremendous photograph came to us there some time ago out of China, where tanks were going into Tiananmen Square, do you remember? Like, and, um, you know, they were going in to do bloody business there. And a little man stepped off the pavement with his shopping bags or whatever he had, like, and stood in front of this convoy of tanks. Now, I think it is time for us all. The pavement is safe. It's a safe place to be. It's for pedestrians. It is time for us to do what that little Chinaman did. Step off the pavement where it's safe. Stand in front of the modern world. Wave a red flag in front of it and say, if human beings want, want to destroy themselves, fine. But in the course of destroying ourselves, we have no right to destroy whales. We have no right to destroy dolphins, gazelles, elephants, behemoths. Like, we have no right to do that. We want to destroy ourselves, fine. But we need to stand in front of the modern world now and speak the great perennial truths into it. And the perennial truths are divine ground, that the whole universe had its origin in divine ground. It is a blossoming out of divine ground and is blossoming still in divine ground. And that there is soul. And by soul, I mean there is something in me that is older and prior to the elements. There's something in me and in all of you that is older and prior to the sun and to the galaxy and to the universe itself. There is something that isn't even involved in the universe. Do you know what I mean? It, 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 it is transcendent. Now, I mean, the condition we're in of having lost our soul or having lost touch, I mean, you can't lose your soul, but what you can do is lose touch with it or lose a sense that you have that kind of transcendent. And when Aristotle talked about man being a rational animal, I mean, it would have been much better had he said the human being is, is a being who is who can be consciously open to the transcendent. Now, can I maybe give you an image of that? I mean, in October or November, like in Canada, you know, the, the ice comes down and the ice cap almost goes down as far as Wisconsin, doesn't it? I mean, or, uh, you know, icy conditions prevail as far south as Wisconsin anyway. So the seas get frozen over and that means that the seals uh, and the walrus who are, who are mammals and um, who need to come up, they have to keep seals breathing holes open in the ice. So they they with their powerful teeth, they keep breathing holes open in the ice. They come up. I think they can only stay down for about at, at most 15, kind of 15 minutes or maybe maybe not even that. But then they have to emerge and breathe oxygen. Now, Taihad de Shadan talked about the lithosphere and the hydrosphere, which is the water sphere around the earth. These, these kind of spheres, like the, 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 the fire sphere, I suppose, at the centre of the earth. Then you have the crust of the earth, which is the lithosphere. And, around, and then you have the water sphere, which is the hydrosphere, which is the oceans. And then he talked about this wonderful thing that has emerged from human beings called the noose sphere. Noose, the Greek word for mind. So we have surrounded it, the earth now, with a mind sphere, with a mind shell, if you like. Now, and he was delighted about that and talked about, about this monstrous thing that he was so delighted by called a brain of brains. Like, at the moment I heard about a brain of brains, like, I want to say, stop the world, I want to get off, like, I don't want to be part of that world. Now, we might call it not a noose sphere, but a noise sphere. And it seems to me sometimes, like, that we have no seals breathing holes in it, in that noise sphere that we have created. It has closed completely over like an ice cap. And we don't breathe transcendentally anymore. I mean, you could take the, Christ the, the seven sacraments of, of Christianity, you could reclaim and look at them as seven seals breathing holes in and through which we breathe sanctifying grace. Now, we need, as, dolphin, as, as walrus and seals need to breathe oxygen and breathe the air in which there is oxygen, we need to breathe transcendentally. But because of this new sphere in which we have no, we've left no seals breathing holes. And I mean, the transcendent isn't just a transcendent without, it is the transcendent within. The transcendent, you can locate it outside or you can locate it inside. It is in both places. Now, we need seals breathing holes into that transcendent realm of sanctifying grace. But they have closed over. And this is why, since we no longer breathe transcendentally, we can continue to do desperate damage to the earth, you know. So it is shape up or shape out time. So 
how do we shape up? Can I maybe tell you a couple of stories like that might even be a beginning, like that might remind us that there is there is a shaping up that we can do. I remember I was I was say I was in Canada for a few years and it used the winter used to come down in October like and Christ it just get cold like this was this was cold like you'd never experienced it in Ireland it was hard there was almost a kind of ferocity in it and like in the way that a lion can be ferocious it, there was a ferocity in it and it was wonderful because like you had to take notice of it and you had to you had to have tremendous respect for this cold you know but snow would fall in November and the thing about snow, the difference between snow there is that the first few flakes that fell there would probably still be there in April. Like So you get this white, white landscape and the blue, blue sky and coming from Ireland, like there were times when I love, I, I longed for clouds. It felt like that I was walking in a mineral because there, was, there wasn't enough vegetation like to saturate it and soften it. You know, it was like walking inside of some pristine, pure, clear, crystalline mineral of a world, you know. And I longed for the protective clouds of Ireland, for the, for, for the shawls, the, the clouds of Ireland. It felt as if my, my, my scalp was lifted off sometimes. And, like, it, it deepened until January and February, and by February, like, one was really weak, and my eyes used to be hungry for colour. And there was one day I was given a lecture, and in the course of the lecture, I kept drifting back to a girl called, I remember her well, Bella Stern. You know, I just kept all the time drifting back to her, and and I, be- I became aware of it, like, and she became aware that I was giving a lot of attention or something, you know, and attention, and she's like, I, I suddenly caught what I was doing. It was just that Bella was wearing a wonderful combination of colours, you know, <laughs> and I kept going back to kind of soothe my eyes, to console and soothe my eyes with the lovely colours she was wearing. Anyway, around that time, someone said to me, uh, there's a film on, uh, a European film on downtown, and I said, Christ, I don't care what's it about, but I'm going because there's a chance there might be a European green field in it. <laughs> you know, so down I went in the hope that I'd see a European green field, and I did. It was wonderful. The film was called Elvera Madigan. I don't know if any of you have seen it. And it's a love story, and I don't know now if I'm remembering it, <laughs> if, I, if I wasn't so entranced by the green fields, like that I, that I, that, that I, I, have, no, I have no good memory at all of what the plot was or the storyline was. But as I imagine it, anyway, as I remember it uh, vaguely, um, I remember Elvera very well. I mean, who couldn't, who, like, you'd have to remember Elvera. But I think there was a travelling circus moving around at the Scandinavian world. And they, they don't go to the big towns. They go to a lot of smallish towns because they aren't the greatest show on earth. Like. And um, one evening they come into, I suppose, a biggish town because there seems to be a club in this town. There is a club in this town in which there are army pers- persons and business persons. And they're in a club. And I think they have eaten. And they're sitting around bored. They're playing pool or reading the paper or smoking their pipes and talking talking about the headlines or whatever it is and someone says there's a circus on in town and a few of them go and a man who is a a middle-aged man a married man a respectable man I think a colonel in the army but anyway a very Victorian respectable man something astonishing happens to him for the first time in his life like he falls profoundly in love like and it has no economic considerations in the world this time like and it, it, there's, there's nothing at all about a good match or a bad match like he sees this woman who walks the, the rope uh, who does the walk the, the rope walking act and he falls in love with her so he goes back the next evening the next evening and Christ the next thing we, we see is they've eloped and they're out in the summer meadows and it is they're walking in the not only in, in the paradise that nature is they're walking in the paradise of their love for each other and they're seeking to catch butterflies but all as they're about to cup their hands on the butterflies the butterflies escape you know but they have their winged existence anyway their love has given them the wings that Plato or Plotines would say we lost on the way down so uh, it is wonderful to watch them and the cameras don't go back and look at the scandalised Victorian society we never hear again about what they're saying back at home about these couples but because they're out there walking the paradise of their love for each other but I suppose it isn't always summer out there sometimes it's winter out there and a couple of winters later uh, we the camera looks at um, um, uh, gives us a close view of Elvera and we think, my God, she's pale. Not only is she pale, there's a pallor under her skin and there's a pallor under her paleness and we wonder, has she got one of the terrible 19th century illnesses? Has she been too exposed to the outside world or what's happening? And then we see her walking through a village and she's done her grocery shopping and she goes into a fortune teller and the fortune teller is dressed in black. She goes upstairs and you can hear the footsteps going up the stairs, up the wooden stairs, the timber stairs and she goes in and this old fortune teller is dressed in black and the fortune teller 
Taylor throws the cards and they come out astonishingly black. I mean, first comes out the Ace of Spades and like whatever way that comes out, it's going to be upside down anyway, isn't it? You know, and then the Queen of Spades and the Jack of Clubs and the King of Clubs and the, the Nine of Spades. Not a red card comes out, not a heart comes out. And so there's a black, a black, a black hand of cards there on the table, lying on the table. And the old fortune teller says, I've never thrown a hand of cards like that. A hand of cards as black as that. It seems to me like that. The future is black, and Elvira, I think, feeling her own, from her own experience of her own body and her own mind, she thinks, yeah, it's that's what I kind of expected. And she goes away. And then there's a morning when it's summer again, and they're sitting under a great beech tree, and they're having what will turn out to be their last meal together, the last breakfast together. And having eaten, she goes away into the summer meadows again, and she's again seeking to catch butterflies, like that first glorious morning when they walked off together. Now again, she's seeking to catch butterflies. And the camera goes back to him, and we see that he's uh, a revolver and that he's loading it. And the camera then goes back again to Elvera, and she's seeking to catch the butterflies. And yes, finally, she's got one. She's cupping her hands on one. She's found her wings. She's found her ascension Thursday. She's found her transcendence. And just at that moment, we hear a shot ring out. And then we know he's shot her, and then he, we hear another shot, and he has shot himself. So we conclude, like, that's the end of the love story, or is that where love begins? Like, are they now just free of their bodies, and can they go on into a paradise that we haven't eyes for? But there's one scene in the film that I would like to draw attention to. They're sitting in a wood, as I remember it, and um, in a clearing in wood. And he's looking at her, and all he has to do is just look at her, and he knows why it is he loves her. He loves her because she is Elvera. She is the woman who she is. What else could you do but be in love with her, like, and lose everything for the sake of being in love with her? But then he thinks about himself, like, and that he's not the bee's knees, like, and what did this gorgeous woman ever see in him, an older man, the pipe-smoking man, you know, the respectable man, the Victorian man? And he asks her, and she looks at him gorgeously, and she says, I will tell you. Until I met you, I only had courage to walk on the rope. You gave me the courage to come down and walk on the ground. Now, in our century, a human being, or human beings have walked on the moon. And when Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon for the first time, he said, it's a small step for me, but it's a giant step for humanity. I want to say to that, Nile, it's a small step for you and it's a very, very small step indeed for humanity. To have walked on the moon is no big deal. Have we walked on the moon, which is a very high place? We've strung, if you like, an invisible rope between us and, and the moon. And have we walked on the moon only because, like Elvera Madigan, we haven't yet had the courage or the grace to come down and walk the great and sacred earth? Because, like, if we could once set foot on the earth, if we could once undertake a space journey to the earth and come to the earth, set foot on the earth into which we were born like we would never want to set foot on Mars we would never want to set foot on any solar system out, uh, in or outside our galaxy you know, there are times like when I'm going home you know, from maybe work I'd be going home from work in the evening and a shower would come and I'd turn into some house some neighbour's house like, and the children would be inside and they'd be watching television and they're away in space somewhere like with, with, with these characters who are so detached Urged. The Lord save us like these uniforms and they're so clean and they don't smell of heather and they don't smell of bog and they don't smell of cows, they smell of stables, they don't smell of anything, they smell of some kind of heart pick, you know, and, and they're away, they're being masters of the universe, like, and I get so sad when I see this because... Outside the window is Connemara. Outside the window are the Glown to Du Kyoig of Connemara. So marvellous is that landscape like, that I can't call it a landscape at all. Like, I went to school and studied Greek. Like, so I remember one day trying to find, and the word land means something economic, doesn't it? And scape means something within, within the scope of your vision, you know? Well, it is neither land nor something that's within the scope of ordinary seeing. So I, the Greek word tauma is, means wonder. And phino is to, to be manifest light, to be manifest manifest like the, the word epiphany the 6th of of january isn't it is the feast of the epiphany so that's the word to, to, to become light or to become manifest so i i, I invented the word like taumophony or a taumadzophony like that the universe is is just is just a continuous manifestation of wonder wonder boiling over boiling over you know wonder over brimming over overflowing any container that it can be in like so you know there they are and they're away deterged in their deterred space like and I feel should the only space journey you should ever set foot on is a journey that will take us home to the earth to the great and sacred earth
Can I just tell you another story now, like just maybe to live with that for a while? I mean, in Genesis, or again, can we leave Genesis now and go to Exodus <laughs> uh, chapter 3, where Moses has come to the backside of Mount Sinai and he's herding the flocks of Jethro, priest of Midian, who is his father-in-law. And it is the noon of the day and he sees a bush that is burning. Now, this is a dry desert bush and it should be instantly almost disintegrated, should be turned into ashes almost immediately. But this bush isn't turning into ashes. It burns and it burns with an intense radiance, an intense fire. And Moses says, I will now turn aside to see this great sight while the bush burns and is not being consumed. And as he's approaching it, a voice calls out, Moses, Moses. And Moses says, here am I. And the voice comes back to him and it's a divine voice. It isn't any longer an angelic voice. We now think it is a divine voice. And the divine voice is saying to it, put off thy shoes from off thy feet for the ground whereon thou standest is holy ground. Now, all ground is holy ground. Even if you're to stand in the Dublin tips or the Dublin dumps, like it is holy ground. You cannot stand anywhere on the earth and not be standing on holy ground. And every bush is a burning bush. Like the old bushes that I see in Connemara. You know, the old Schack gal that you'll, that you'll meet on a bog road and it is horizontal flowing with the wind. Do you know what I mean? It is, it, is, it is going the wind's way. You know, it is going the prevailing way of the universe. It isn't resisting the universe. It's flowing its way. I mean, those old little bushes there in Connemara, they too are burning bushes. They are burning with green fire in the spring. They're burning with red fire of haws in the, in the autumn. They're burning with jewel blue fire. They're burning with fire that I haven't eyes for, that I haven't senses for. And it took maybe someone like Van Gogh, like when he painted a few cypresses in Provence, like to show us that a tree, in fact, is, is, is a green column of flame. It is, it is green fire-like. So every bush is a burning bush, and all ground is holy ground. And it would be an awful shame, like, never to have spent 70 years on the earth and never to have put off your shoes from off your feet and set foot, barefoot on, on, on holy ground that the earth is. Like, and not just to put off your, sh- your physical shoes from off your feet, but to put off the old shoe of European thinking or Western bad habits from off your heart. Put off the old shoe of European theories and creeds, like to put them off from off your mind, and to walk the earth with a barefoot heart and a barefoot brain. Because most of the time, like Elvira Madigan walking the tightrope, because there she, was, there she was safe, there she was comfortable, there she was happy, and she hadn't the courage to come down and walk. Most of us spend our time walking the Nicene creeds and uh, Apostles' creeds and E equals MC squared and theories about the earth and creeds about the earth and beliefs about the earth, but none of us ever like really come home and set foot in the earth. And I can imagine someone arriving in heaven, like if you have a child's view of what will happen to us eschatologically we arrive and someone arrives in heaven and there's some kind of maybe interrogation and the last question is well you've spent 70 70 years down there on the earth now did you ever actually set foot on it and the person thinks and thinks and thinks this just now that i think of it maybe i didn't and the the archangel getting very cross and saying well will you feck off down now and we'll give you one other 770 we'll give you another chance now of 70 years go down and if you set foot on the earth and the feeling i have is like that if you did set foot on the earth if you did put off your shoes from off your feet and you did set foot on the earth, then you are already setting foot in paradise. Do you know what I mean? The earth is paradise. I mean, paradise is lost, but it's only lost in our eyes. It is only in our minds and in our senses that it is lost. We're walking in paradise. Paradise, it isn't a paradise where the wolf will lie down with the, will lie down with the lamb, and it isn't a paradise like maybe where, where the, the lion will eat straw, which is a lion that eats straw, like who wants to... I mean, that would be a very degenerate lion in some way, wouldn't it be, you know? So, like, when, I'm, when we in the West talk about in excelsis, you know, we look up, don't we? Now, walking to work in Connemara, when I use the word in excelsis, I look down because I'm walking in excelsis, you know. And once you set foot on the earth in that kind of way, then you never want to set foot on the moon. Then you never want to set foot on Mars, never want to set foot elsewhere in your galaxy than where you actually are. It is no big deal to go into space. We're in space anyway, aren't we? So this sense of coming home to the earth, like... Okay, in the 17th century, we did walk into this nothing but universe. But the day, the day you take off your shoes from off your feet, the day the Red Sea 
of the aqueous humour and the vitreous humour of your eyes open and you look through again, you see again and see that every bush is a burning bush. That is the day like that you know you're back home in a stupendous earth. And if we could only wake up to that, then we would never again misbehave on the earth. Now, can I just put it like this? Maybe it is and maybe it isn't an exaggeration, but nowadays... Women are enfranchising themselves, aren't they? Like, in the last century, women didn't have the vote and women didn't have any legal power within in the family farm or whatever it is. Like, So now women have and are in, have enfranchised themselves and are continuing to enfranchise themselves. I just want to say, why don't we also go further and enfranchise the universe, enfranchise the whole earth and everything in it? Now... Would I run the risk, maybe, of quoting a few things for you, or will I? Or will I? Or will I I'll, no, maybe, maybe I won't quote them. Maybe I'll just, I'll just give you a summary of it. I want to talk about three mystical experiences that three different people had. Three people uh, on whom we can rely absolutely and totally. One of them is a Rhineland mystic called Suzo, and one day he walked in to to. The, the chapel in his convent or in his monastery or in his friary and he sat in, a, in one of the choir stalls on the prior side and after a while there was, there was a heavy burden of suffering upon him. He was in a state of great suffering at the time uh, because I don't know why but he doesn't tell us why but very shortly he was in ecstasy. He was wrapped out of his body. He didn't know whether he was in his body or out of it. And he goes on to talk about the marvels that he was experiencing and the brightness that he was experiencing. And then he talks about heavenly lightnings passing and repassing in the deeps of his being. Can I just repeat that for you? Like heavenly lightnings passing and repassing in the deeps of his being. It's as if, like, we know the northern lights, don't we, like that you see in Canada or see in Scotland or sometimes see even in Connemara. You know, these great kind of curtains of light up as far as the zenith of the sky, like weaving themselves back and forth, tremendous, and we call them sometimes auroras. You know, now, there are auroras of soul as well. I know there aren't just cosmic auroras, there are auroras of soul. And when you walk into Chartres Cathedral, that's what you feel that they did, like they, they somehow are the constructed, the stained glass windows of Chartres, Les Vitraux de la France like the windows of France are in some sense an attempt to make manifest the heavenly light that is within and the heavenly light that was without the, the light of the, of the Empyrean pouring through that stained glass like into the, into the church in the morning and in the evening I mean these, th- these are auroras of soul, so here's Suzo having an experience of the hidden auroras that are within him, or the occluded auroras that suddenly the eclipse is over and he's seeing the auroras of soul, heavenly lightnings passing and repassing in the depths of his being. One day Teresa of Avila had an experience, she had several experiences and often saw angels but one day it was the highest of angels, those we call cherubim, who sat beside her stood, found that she, uh, this angel was beside her and he had a long golden spear and at the tip of it was an iron point and on, on the point was a little fire and he plunged that spear, this golden angel, plunged the spear into her heart again and again and again, into her entrails. And each time he pulled it out, he seemed to be pulling out her entrails with it. And she goes on to talk about the incredible pain of it, but the incredible joy of it. And all Trees of Avila can do, like, in relation to this experience, to say, if you disbelieve me, I hope that God will grant you this kind of experience, and then you will know that this kind of thing is possible to a human being. That is called Teresa of Avila's transverberation. And Pascal, the Frenchman, he was a great mathematician, a great scientist, a man in all ways reliable and alert, a great mind, one of Europe's great minds. And after he died, his housekeeper was going through his effects and she was tidying up things and she was going through his clothes and she was putting her hands in his pockets and she had his, his waistcoat finder or his doubloon or whatever it would have been and um, there's nothing in one pocket but then she feels there's something, there's something somewhere and she, she then discovers that it's actually sewn into the lining whatever it is so she unstitches the lining of this um, waistcoat and she finds a small piece of parchment and it has come to be known since as the memorial of his night of fire and I don't remember the dates now, 1654, on the 23rd of November, 1654, from half past ten in the evening till half past midnight, fire. The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, not the God of the philosophers. 
he, and the scholars. He talks about oublie monde, forgetfulness of the world and everything outside of God. And he goes on to talk about the world has not known you, but I have known you. And then he says, joie, 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 plaire de joie, joy, 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 tears of joy. Now it's written on a tiny little piece of parchment. So this is Pascal's Night of Fire. We have Suzo's Noon of Heavenly Lightnings, and we have Teresa of Avila's Transverberation. Now, it sometimes seems to me that there's an old doctrine of the microcosm and the macrocosm, isn't there? Like that I am a microcosm of the great macrocosm. I am what, what Sir Thomas Brown calls a compendium of the sixth day. Like, in little, I am the whole universe. And all that, I mean, Beme and the rest of them would talk like this, like that I am the whole universe. Now, it seems to me sometimes that the best way to discover or to talk about the, the macrocosm, the universe at large, is to talk about yourself as a microcosm. Like, the best clue to what the universe is, is a microcosmic understanding of it, not a macrocosmic. I mean, you will understand it microcosmically first and then macrocosmically. Now, I want to say, if that is so, and if the microcosm in the person of Suzo experienced a noon of heavenly lightnings passing and repassing in the deeps of his being, if Teresa of Avila experienced a transverberation where a heavenly fire was plunged again and again into her heart, and if Pascal experienced a night of fire, why then can't we, enfranchising the universe, why then can't we say every atom in the universe can experience, can have its noon of heavenly lightnings, can have its night of fire, and can have its transverberation? Every star in the universe can have, it, can have it. Every galaxy can have it. There is nothing in the universe that cannot experience Pascal's night of fire. So we live in a possibly transverberating and transverberated universe. You know, so why not? Like, like, we will then, if, if that is so, then like there's a chance like that we will walk, that we will put off our shoes from off our feet and we'll walk the earth knowing that it is a great and sacred earth. So we mustn't stop with enfranchising women. We must go on and enfranchise the whole universe. Isn't it a terrible thing like to close the door on atoms? I think in America now there's a debate going on to build a new accelerator and it will cost billions, like billions of dollars to build, build this. And what they'll do with it, like they'll, they'll be crashing subatomic particles off each other to see if they can further break them down into the, the, the ultimate building block. Now, Supposing that, let, let's put it like this, supposing like one day we did find the ultimate particle, this is it, this is, the, smaller than this there isn't. And I want to say, take it now, I mean, I'm talking picturesquely now, I want to say, <clears throat> don't stop there, because that's like Pascal's waistcoat. Unstitch that, there's a lining in that, unstitch it, and inside you will find a little piece of parchment, a memorial of its night of fire. The truth about the universe is really ecstasy. The truth about the universe is a noon of heavenly lightnings, is a transverberation. The truth about it is a night of fire, you know, and, and it is, in a sense, almost oubli du monde, is the truth about the universe. Forgetfulness of the universe is, in a sense, you know, um, the truth about it. But the moment you forget it is the moment you come back into it again, and now you remember it. So, like, if we could only wake up to the fact that we live in a stupendous universe, if we could only know that every bush is a burning bush, if only, like Elvera Madigan, we would come down from our tightropes, our tears and creeds, and stand on the earth, then we wouldn't be harming the earth. Then we wouldn't be damaging the earth. Then we wouldn't be killing whales. Then we'd put up our swords and we'd put up our harpoons. Then we wouldn't want to go into space. Do you know what I mean? And there are times when I'm going to work and I bless gravity. You know, I give thanks for gravity because there is the coming down of Christmas night, isn't there? Do you know, Christmas night where, where as Yeats would say, God came down like to the to the to the, the bestial floor, you know, being by Calvary's turbulence and hoping to find once more, being by Calvary's turbulence and satisfied the uncontrollable mystery on the bestial floor. God didn't just come down to the human level, he came down to the animal level, he came down to the stable floor. Like, So there's the coming down of Christmas night and there's the ascent of Ascension Thursday. Now, the best way, it seems to me, so, and there's gravity and grace, isn't there? Like, Jesus coming down and being willing to submit to gravity, but then there's the moving away from gravity on Ascension Thursday. The 
the best way, I think, to experience grace is to willingly submit to gravity. I mean, I give thanks to gravity. We think it's great that we've broken through gravity and escaped the earth's gravity in our century. Jesus, I give thanks to gravity for keeping me on the earth, keeping me looking down at it, because in the earth I'm walking in excelsis. And the best way to experience grace is to willingly submit and to willingly surrender to gravity. So, like, what I'm talking about now is a space journey to the earth, is a coming home to the earth. And later this evening, maybe, I would like to tell a few stories, Native North American Indian stories, that might lead us maybe into that earth. So, you know, the D.H. Lawrence went a lot to America, um, down to New Mexico, wasn't it? Down to Taos in New Mexico. And made a lot of uh, rather fine, I think, contact with Native North Americans. And, but before he went, he, he advised himself or challenged himself to take up the trail of the vanished American, where it disappeared at the foot of the crucifix. Take up the primordial Indian obstinacy, the more than human dense insistence of will and disdain and blankness and onrush, and prize open the new day with them. But for all his contact with Native North Americans, D. H. Lawrence realised that he was a pale face. Um, that he was white, and even though way back in the resinous ages, as he says, that he might have had a, a red father, an old red great 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 grandfather, he was a changeling son. And he realized in his own wonderful words that I can't cluster at the drum anymore. Can I just quote that? I was born of no virgin, of no Holy Ghost. Ah, uh, I know these old men telling the tribal tales were my fathers. I have a dark faced, bronze voiced father far back in the resinous ages. But he, like many an old father with a changeling son, he would like to deny me. But I stand on the edge of their firelight now, and I am neither denied nor accepted. My way is my own, old red father. I can't cluster at the drum any more. Young experienced this in Africa as well, didn't he? There was one night, I think, in Kenya in Africa, when he watched a tribal dance, and he was just about to move over, to move out, over, out, out of his pale-faced civilization out of his pale-faced way and move into the way of Africa to join the dance. And he suddenly realised that had he done it, uh, he would experience probably psychic uh, implosion or psychic destruction. He, would, uh, he wouldn't come out of it, he wouldn't emerge uh, safe and sane out of that experience. So he actually, I think, um, it's in Myths, Dreams and Memories, he actually, I think, took a whip to them. Now, I am profoundly aware, telling the few Indian stories that I might tell, that I am a pale face. And like to Hitch Lawrence, I can't go back, I pretend to go back to the resinous ages. I am the changeling son um, that D.H. Lawrence talks about here. So, uh, but I do feel like I can't cluster at the drum anymore. Um, but the, when I came back from Canada to Connemara, it wasn't Aristotle or Plato, or it wasn't any of the European philosophies or psychologists that helped me to stand again on the earth below in Connemara. As you know, Connemara is a kind of Aboriginal earth, with the mountains and the great mirroring dimension, which is the lakes, the lakes mirroring the mountains that you look at. And sometimes, like when you see the mountains mirrored in the lakes, you feel that the mountains know they're being mirrored. They're almost, they aren't quite narcissus-like, they aren't admiring themselves, they aren't about to drown because they're going to fall into the lakes in admiration to themselves, but like that mirroring dimension, that holy kind of marvellous um, dimension that you see in Connemara. Anyway, it was, it's a kind of savage landscape, and in the winter it can be savage and Aboriginal. And the only way to live in that world is to be Aboriginal. I mean, every winter, like, like a buffalo, I had to turn, in the way that a buffalo turns round and faces into the blizzard, like the buffalo doesn't run from the blizzard, a buffalo, great stupendous being, turns round and faces into the blizzard. The only thing you can do is face north, northwest. <laughs> Like uh, or west northwest, like and face that no man's land between Iceland and Greenland, where so much of the winter weather is made, and stand there like a, a, a buffalo and say, "I'm I'm I'm for another winter here," but um, it wasn't, as I said, Plato and Aristotle who helped me again to stand on that earth. I was, I remember one day I was out in the bogs in Balakanili, and I was sitting on a rock lying on a rock at the edge of a lake and I heard the lap, 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 lap of the water and there was a scald crow above me with her terrible kind of voice. It didn't sound a great voice that day. Um, it hadn't any of Mozart's and Dante's in it. And um, I got up and I walked away 
And um, I was in some kind of distress because I thought, my God, is this the kind of divine voice of the universe? I mean, is this, is this the heavens talking at me in the skull crow's voice? And I walked away and I was a European with a European education. And after walking across the high head and the bog, suddenly a hair broke away from me. And I just collapsed down because I'd been doing a lot of thinking up to then. And I collapsed down onto the bog and I eased my head down into the hare's form, into the wild form of the hare. And I asked that primordial wild form there to heal my head, to be a kind of poultice and to suck out my European education. Because a European head hurt to the earth. I mean, I had, if you like, kind of expensive European education. And yet at the end of that education, I think the only thing my head could do in the way it saw the earth, in the way it thought about the earth, like that my European head hurt the earth it was damaged to the earth and I felt I had to start again and going up into the Glantadukioig of Connemara it wasn't um, you know Descartes or it wasn't um, you know even Shakespeare who take me up it was some old Aboriginal stories and some old Native North American Indian stories that took me by the hand and took me back into the earth and I would like to tell some of those stories here this evening now to you but before we break into them can I just say like that All time is once upon a time time, isn't it? Like, you know, even now, tonight, you know, know, the the fairy stories that would start once upon a time. And the moment you hear once upon a time, you let go of the common sense world, don't you? Or the practical world, the common sense world, the world of Aristotle's principle of non-contradiction. You let go of all of that and the house can be a gingerbread house and and little Red Riding Hood can go through the wood and not find her grandmother in the bed. So, like, all time is, is... Once upon a time time. And these stories grow out of that once upon a time time. And once upon a time time is a perennial state of mind. And I think it is when we enter once upon a time time, we are nearer the creative genius of the universe. We are then, I think, walking where, uh, according to Australian Aborigines, the Alturinga Mitgina, the eternal ones of the dream in the beginning walked, that creative dream time that is in the beginning. So, like... Common sense expectations, you know, ought ideally now to fall away. And we have, uh, I suppose, Yeats's Song of the Wandering Angus. Surely that is, took place, what, hap- what is described in that poem took place in Once Upon a Time Time. Do you remember? I went out to the hazel wood because a fire was in my head and plucked and peeled a hazel wand and hooked a berry to a thread and when white moths were on the wing and moth like stars were flickering out, I cast the berry in a stream and caught a little silver <coughs> trout. When I had laid it on the floor, I went to blow the fire aflame, but something rustled on the floor and someone called me by my name. It had become a glimmering girl with apple blossom in her hair who called me by my name and ran and faded through the brightening air. Though I am old with wandering through hollow lands and hilly lands, I will find out where she has gone and kiss her lips and take her hands and walk among long dappled grass and pluck till time and times are done the silver apples of the moon, the golden apples of the sun. So, like, we want to now walk into that world where a silver trout, the fire, the tremendous fire, you enter the hazel wood, and the fire is in your... And the hazel wood is, is a dimension of your own mind. The hazel wood isn't so much a wood outside, it is a state of your own psyche, it's a state of mind, and Angus went into this, and the trout becoming a glimmering girl with apple blossom in her hair. And so maybe with these stories, that's what we'll do, we'll follow the girl with apple blossom in her hair, and there are times like when I'm walking to work in the morning, like, and I just feel like saying, if someone asks me where are you going, like, I'm following the girl with apple blossom in her hair, you know what I mean? So I don't know, like, where I want to end up, you know? Like, we have to become kind of children again, because it might be that the fairy stories of the world bring us nearer to the world, maybe, than Newton's laws of gravity, or than, uh, or than, or than equals MC squared, or what have you, you know? So could I start with a Navajo story, you know, simply because it is a story about maybe the first morning or the second morning, or um, the third morning of the world, in the beginning shall we call it the great creative beginning there was first man and first woman and there was a daughter in the house or a young woman in the house called white bead girl now I don't know how she was called white bead girl did she have a necklace with one bead or what had she as a child found one bead but anyway her name was white bead girl and one day first man came into the Hogan their brush their Hogan and he said um the grasses at the eastern foothill of the mesa are now ripening. Uh, maybe you would go and harvest 
service them. So the mother and the daughter, the mother who was first woman and the daughter who was white bead girl, they set off. And they went to the eastern foothills, which was a long, long way away. They went to the eastern foothills of the Mesa and they were collecting these grass seeds. And the mother then, first woman, became very frightened because she thought, we've left we've left the known, the known world, we've left the known territory here. And she became terrified that maybe there are monsters all around us here watching us. And she said to white bead girl, let's go back. Even though they hadn't completely harvested the grasses, let's go back. So they went back. But during the next few days, white bead girl felt a great yearning in her to go back and continue the harvesting. And she was now at a stage when she was yearning for a mate. And there was no other man in her world, but she was yearning for a mate. And she would find herself lying on the great and sacred earth. And she would find herself lying towards the sun. And she was available to the sun and yearning for the sun and sometimes she would lie under great overhangs uh, in the canyons under the rocks and um, so she was lying towards things she was yearning for a mate um, finally her first woman gave her permission to go and harvest the, um, the, the remaining grass seeds and as uh, she was there harvesting suddenly she was aware of something beside her, a tremendous presence some tremendous presence she hardly dared to lift her head but as she just looked sideways still looking at the ground she saw the hooves of a horse and then she saw that looking up she saw there were white legs uh, but they were glorious legs of this glorious horse and then she saw a great sun being standing uh, uh, that mounted on the horse that was riding this horse and it was a great sun being who was beside her the sun she had been lying towards and um, the sun being the sun person said to her I have seen your intentions towards me I have seen your yearnings towards me and I have come down now and I will give you some instructions go back and tell your father to build a brush hogan for you, a small brush hogan out in the wilderness and um, with what you have harvested with this uh, seed, make a meal of these seeds and get the pollen of flowers and divide it into four sections, put it in a basket put the meal in a basket and divide it into four sections and do you and your father when it is evening. Come to the brush Hogan. Your father will stay there until midnight and then he will go home to first woman but you must stay on. So she went back and told the story of the great encounter with this tremendous sun being, this glorious sun being. And the father uh, first man was very unhappy about this. My God, now life is difficult enough but this is woman's hysteria, this is women's imagination. I mean coping with ordinary realities is, 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 is difficult enough but when I start coping with fantasies is well as facts you know but she continues to insist and finally she prevails upon him and he does build the brush hogan and evening comes and she goes off with her basket um the basket of meal with the four divided into four sections by two different kinds of pollen two different colored pollen and they sit in this brush hogan and when it comes to midnight he goes back to first woman and she remains on in the hogan and then morning comes and she goes back and the first man asks her did anything happen and she says no and he flies into a rage thinking didn't I know it was women's hysteria didn't I know it was fantasy we must stick with the facts the facts are difficult enough she said no nothing happened but when I woke this morning there was a hoof mark of a, ho of a horse a horse's hoof track on the floor of the Hogan and one section of the meal was taken so again she prevailed on him and persuaded him to go with her that evening and he did go and midnight came and he went back and she stayed on and the next morning she came home and he said did anything happen and she said no but this morning there were two hoof tracks of a horse on the brush hogan and another section of the meal was taken so again reluctantly and however reluctantly he went uh, a third evening with her and stayed till midnight and he went back to first woman his wife and she remained on and in the morning when she came back the story she had to tell was three hoof marks and a third um, section of the meal gone and then the fourth night he came with her and stayed till midnight and went back and on the fourth um, morning she came back and did anything happen and she said yes um, there were four hoof, hoof marks of a horse on the floor and the fourth section of the meal was taken and I felt someone touch me I was touched very profoundly and very deeply in some very deep place in my being while I was asleep I was touched and when I woke up it was as if a river had flowed over me um, I, and um, now I'm back 
And a few days later, um, she was talking to first woman. First man was out in doing uh, hunting, and she was talking to first woman. She said, "I feel something moving inside of me." And the first woman says, "You are now with child. That son being that you had so yearned for, you have conceived of that son being, and you're now." And you, you now have conceived. And a few months later, she gave birth to the great warriors, the great um, heroes of the Navajo. Now, that's a story, and we have it, like the sun coming down and mating with a human being. I mean, in the Christian story, it is the Holy Ghost coming down and overshadowing Mary. And uh, that gave birth to a new civilization, the meeting of heaven and earth. A new civilization will always be born out of, um, if it's to be a good civilization, will always be born out of a meeting between heaven and earth. I mean, it happened in Lead and the Swan, according to Yeats, um, like Zeus in the form of a swan came down and raped Leda, and when Leda was walking away, she was carrying the splendours of Greece in her womb. Um, Yeats asked to cheap her on his knowledge with his power before the indifferent beak could let her drop. But she went away carrying, she, whether she, whether she didn't knew it or not, she went away carrying the Odyssey and the Iliad in her womb. She went away carrying the Parthenon womb, Greek philosophy, Greek tragedy, at the place of Sophocles and 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 Aeschylus and uh, Euripides in her womb. Um, like the glories and the splendours of Greece she was carrying there in her womb. Now, if she knew that she was carrying all of these splendours and could see them, then um, she might feel less violated and she might feel less brutalised by having been raped by the great um, uh, explosion of, of swan wings and thunder all round about her. So here we have this Navajo girl, white bead girl, lying towards the sun. Now, I just want to say, like... Can we lie towards our sun? Francis of Assisi called the sun brother sun and sister moon. And I talked a while ago about enfranchising the universe. Like, and maybe the only European that I know of who, who did actually walk the earth with a barefoot heart and a barefoot brain was Francis of Assisi. And he, didn't he, I mean, he enfranchised the universe. The, the moment you say brother sun and sister moon and sister brother fire and sister wind and sister death, you know... So here is a woman lying towards the great solar radiance. And I think maybe we should all know, I talked earlier about our auras of soul, about soul in us, the transcendent in us. Maybe we should all lie down in the earth sometimes and lie towards our own inner radiance and conceive of that radiance, be born again of that radiance, lie towards the sun. I mean, even though I'm a man, like, why shouldn't I be a white bead girl, like, and lie on the mountaintop in Connemara, like, under the sun someday, like, but, I mean, the sun I'd be lying to wouldn't be Newton's sun. I mean, it would be the old Helios I'd be lying towards, you know, it would be the old, the old great son of the Navajo, you know, the sun being, you know, but it would be lying to my own auroras of soul. You know, we need, you know, Jesus says we need to be born again, but maybe we can be born again of our own inner radiance. We aren't just transformed groceries. There is so something called soul in us, and there are auroras of soul. And I love, like, to be just, I mean, we hear so much that we are Oedipus and that we are, you know, the Hitler in us. And, you know, I mean, in the 20th century, we hear an awful lot about what is terrible in us. Like, and, you know, Freud went down into the Eid in us, didn't he, you know? And that was an Eid of swamp energies and terrible energies and animal energies. Like, but can there be blessed spirits in us too? Can't we say that, that there's something more than that there are depths below the psyche and there are radiances below the psyche and all my psyche does is eclipse those radiances and that I would lie towards the radiances that my psyche eclipses, my psyche conscious and unconscious um, that they eclipse. So like okay I'm Oedipus you know I too I suppose as a young adolescent wanted you know to, to murder my father and sleep with my mother like maybe maybe I, all of those are true of me but can't I say also like that I'm white beard girl and to lie towards my own radiance you know and the day you lie towards your own radiance then like you are like the song of the wandering Angus then you are following the girl with apple blossom in her hair and just maybe you've apple blossom in your own hair do you know what I mean maybe like we need to blossom Awesome, don't we? I mean, Lawrence says that uh, D.H. Lawrence that I just quoted, he talks about uh, in, our, uh, in our 20s, most of us become finished creations, you know. Uh, but we should be growing throughout our whole life. Like, there's a great growing. We should go, go through. I mean, we talk about one puberty, a sexual puberty, don't we? But the Lord save us, like, 
why is there only one puberty? Why shouldn't there be several puberties? Do you know, and and puberties that aren't sexual puberties, but I'm saying growings that are are as big as puberty, but they're spiritual growings. And but we become a role, don't we? And we close down, and uh, we're afraid of more growing because more growing means more growing pains, and means maybe we'll have to break out of our marriages or break out of our commitments or something like that. That we'll that we won't be able to 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 be respectable John citizen of the law. So you know, to be as Europeans, like to be the daughter, if you like, of first man and first woman. And to be white bead girl, and if you're a man, you're still white bead girl. Why not? I mean, to, as a man, to be white bead girl and to lie towards the sun and to lie towards the mountains and to lie towards the stars and to conceive of the genius of the universe, to conceive of the tremendousness of the universe. It might mean like that you won't be able to keep your job with, uh, with, 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 with the Bank of Ireland or whatever, whatever you're working like. It might mean that you're, you're going to find that difficult. But sometimes, like, I think Rilke has a poem, hasn't he, about, uh, you might remember it, uh, where I think, um, what is it? Uh, a man is sitting down at evening with, uh, you know, with his family and he's eating and suddenly he has a vision of a church in the Orient or in the East somewhere and he just gets up and he goes, you know. And the family see him going... I, I, I don't know the poem very well now, but I, I, I'm, I'm thinking of it from memory and maybe a bad translation, but he goes away anyway, and the children kind of, and the wife perform a kind of burial rite on him because they know he's not going to come back. He's following a tremendous vision. I mean, so he's not going to come back, and the children are quite happy. They're, they're left a little bit physically destitute, but the children are quite happy because they won't now have to sit out and do it. Once the father has done it, like, he'll be doing it for them. Do you know what I mean? So... Anyway, he broke through, this man broke through, I suppose, the, I suppose, you know, the impediment of duty, in a sense, like, and went off. But he, had a, he was blessed in having a family that understood him, you know. Mm-hmm. So to be a white beard girl, I just want to tell that first Navajo story because this evening, if we continue to tell the stories that I have in mind, we will end up again back with the Navajo. So could I just leave that story there, uh, White Beat Girl, the story, the story of White Beat Girl, and tell another story. Can I move now to the Sioux Indians? The Sioux Indians are almost like, uh, they are the Great Plains people. When you think of the Plains Indians, you think of the Sioux Indians. Um, you have to think of that whole world out there, you know, this east, uh, east of the Rockies, the Great Plains, the Great Prairies, the big sky, the big, uh, it isn't the land. And like when an Indian stands on the, on the earth in the morning like for him it isn't just an economic proposition it isn't an economic proposition at all it is big medicine you know anyway a time came among the Sioux when uh, it was winter and um, they would go out in the morning and there were no buffalo the buffalo on the prong hall all the animals had vanished they were withdrawn beyond the furthest horizon and this happened morning after morning throughout a long winter and um, the people were dying the old people in the teepees were dying and um, it looked as if it was that the animals were no longer offering themselves to be food to the people they had withdrawn from humanity uh, they had left humanity alone in their world so they lived in this crystalline world of snow and cold and the animals and they live so closely with the animals the, the, every teepee like is has so much of the buffalo in it because the skin of the buffalo is 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 the cloth for the teepee and their needles are buffalo bones and you know so they live they live with the buffalo almost in a kind of symbiosis in a state of psychological symbiosis with the buffalo but now they had withdrawn beyond the furthest horizon and one morning at the end of their strength two warriors went out and they stood they climbed a a little low hill and they looked into the great big crystalline world of snow and ice and kind of fire to ice and fire because the sun was coming up and they they expected to see they saw what they expected to see emptiness the great emptiness no buffalo no animals anywhere but then as they were standing there wondering whether they would just collapse down into the snow and die and let death come upon them this one of them saw a shining and he drew attention to the other and they saw in the very distance the great distance almost right beside the horizon they saw a great shining and then as they continued to look at it the shining seemed to be coming towards them and as it came nearer it sometimes seemed to have a four-footed gait but then again it would have a two-footed gait and as it came approaching them it would 
it would change from a four-footed gate to a two-footed gate several times. And then as it came very near them, they saw that it was a woman dressed in shining buckskin. And she stood very close to them at the end. And one of the men, even though he was at the end of his physical strength, seeing the wonder and splendor and the beauty of this woman, he had sexual desires towards her. And he communicated his intentions and his desires to his neighbor. And she clairvoyantly and uh, telepathically knew what was happening. And she called him down as if inviting him to sexual togetherness with her. But um, when he came near her, she surrounded him in a mist, and the mist remained for a while, and then it scattered, and when the mist scattered, the man above on the hill, the man the, rema- the man who remained there, looked down and he saw this woman dressed in shining buckskin, but at her feet, just a little heap of bones and worms. She had, um, he was destroyed by his nearness to the tremendous power that was in this woman. And then she said to the, ma- to the man who was on the hill, I am greatly holy, and I am come from the Buffalo people. I am one of the Buffalo people. I am greatly holy. Go back and tell your people that I wish to come among them, and there are things, there are gifts that I would like to give them. And uh, prepare a great um, Sundance Lodge for me with the 24 posts, and um, as, as if you were building one for the Sundance. So this man at the end of his physical strength, somehow or other now, having just heard this woman communicate her wishes to him, he found strength in him that he didn't know was in him. It wasn't in him physiologically or psychologically, it wasn't in him. But from somewhere deep within, from somewhere below body or below mind in him, he found a tremendous strength in him. And now he was not only able to turn and fa- go back to to his uh, to the encampment, he was able to run back, and he run, ran through the teepees into the, um, into the teepee of the chief, who was called Chief Standing, hollow horn. Isn't it wonderful like some of these Indian names like Rolling Thunder, the names they give themselves Rolling Thunder or Crazy Horse or Chief Sitting Bull. Can you imagine like, <coughs> walking into a tax office someday and someone asking you like what's your name and saying Star Water Woman you know, or that I am Rolling Thunder Do you know, I mean the, 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 the incredible names they gave themselves so this is Chief Standing Hollow Horn and he told him what the, what the woman dressed in shining buckskin had said So they immediately, and again, all the people now found strength. They didn't know where it came from, but they found the strength. And they built a great Sundance Lodge with the 24 posts, covered it, and they waited the next morning, they waited for it to come, but she didn't come. And the second morning they waited and she didn't come. The third morning she didn't come, but the fourth morning there she was coming among them. And she walked through the teepees and went into the Sundance Lodge where the elders were gathered together. And a few days later she emerged and the people didn't know what had happened in the Sundance Lodge, but they saw her walk away, and she walked um, through them, through the teepees, and they went out after her, and they watched her. And as she went away, um, not far away, when she was already not very far away from them, she rolled on the ground, and she was a brown buffalo. She got up a beautiful woman, and again she walked away. A second time she rolled on the ground, and she was a red buffalo. She rose up again, a beautiful woman, and she walked away. A third time she rolled on the ground, and she, as she was a black buffalo, she rose up a beautiful woman, and she walked away. And then at the shimmering edge of the horizon, uh, she rolled again on the ground, and she was a white buffalo calf. And then she got up a beautiful woman, and she walked away, and that was it. They couldn't see her anymore. And then the people, the elders, emerged from the great Sundance Lodge, and they knew that she had brought their religion to the Sioux people. Above all, she had brought their sacred pipe to the Sioux. Now, the sa- we talk about the peace pipe, and we talk uh, derogatively about it, don't we, sometimes? But the pipe to the Sioux is what the Arda chalice is to Christians. I mean, the chalice to Christians is that vessel, isn't it? It, that great sacred vessel in which the heavens and the earth meet and not only meet, they kind of fertilise each other uh, or certainly the, the earthly elements are fertilised and um, uh, irradiated by by the heavenly presence of, of, of an influence coming down from the heavens so the chalice is a, something tremendously sacred, you wouldn't take the chalice out to your cow stall in the morning to milk the cows into it because it is the vessel in which heaven and earth meet, now the pipe to the Sioux Indian is the same is the same kind of ritual uh, 
sacred object. Um, when an Indian goes out in the morning and fills his, that pipe with smoke and he stands there with, um, with a buffalo skull at his feet and maybe an eagle's feather in his hair and he smokes that pipe and um, he, he gives thanks and he prays to it and he offers it to the sacred powers in the east and to the sacred powers in the west and to the sacred powers in the north and the sacred powers in the south and to the powers above and to the earth beneath him. Like, and then he will say, all my relatives... In that pipe, the whole universe is meeting now in that pipe, and it is meeting sacredly in that pipe. Just as heaven and earth meet in our chalice, the whole universe is now meeting here in this pipe. And he will talk about all my relatives. And when a, a, a native North American means all my relatives, everything is included in, like, I mean, he has literally enfranchised everything, everything the stars, the animals, animals that were in the old days, animals that will be everything, the blade of grass, everything is his relatives. So she had come and she was now known as white buffalo calf woman because out in the prairies when when a white an albino buffalo is born, that's regarded as, 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 as an exceptional event and a, a great beneficence now has happened because the white buffalo, uh, an albino buffalo, is regarded as greatly sacred. And this is a carrier of tremendous power, sacred power to the people. So in, her, in their last sight of her, she became a white buffalo calf and she is known as white buffalo calf woman. And she had brought their six rights to the Sioux people, their six religious rights to the Sioux people. And the, these people now were able to take them. If you almost like, I talked while I go about, while I go about the six sacraments, um, you know, as six seals, breathing holes in and through which we can breathe transcendentally. These six rites would enable the Sioux people to stand in another way, in a more beautiful way upon the earth, to be with all things in a totally new way. And now that they had accepted these these rituals, which in fact collectively would be their religion. Now that they had accepted them, one morning, the next morning they went out and there were the, all the animals coming back. Um, the great herds of buffalo, the pronghorn coming back, the prairie dogs coming back, the coyotes coming back. They had all come back. Because, I mean, the image we get is that the animals have withdrawn from human beings because human beings didn't know how to be on the earth anymore. You know, and I th do think like that animals will withdraw from us. If we continue to be the way we are, like we will be left alone on the earth. So this story takes place at a time of great hunger, hunger among the people. And I talked about modern science leading us into a kind of desert of Zin into the nothing but universe. We live in a kind of nothing but universe now and if we continue to see animals in the way that we do see them as kilos of meat and we see trees as cubic feet of timber, it might be that one morning we'll wake up and the universe will have withdrawn from us and left us alone. It's left us stranded and alone. So it behoves us like to stand on a new way on the earth and not to stand against but to stand with all things. Can I tell you a little story in relation to that now, you know, that might just illustrate what I want to say? Like, the great day had arrived at home in North Kerry. I'm talking about now, we're not out in the plains anymore, but... Um, the great day had arrived, like it was Christmas Eve and Jack Scanlon and Mick McGrath and Tadian Handron and the rest of them wouldn't be coming in to our house this evening. But there was, there was more than... Like, we weren't disappointed on that account because this evening was Christmas Eve and... The window of our farmer's kitchen, normally that was just a white a transparency between an ordinary inside and an ordinary outside. But this evening there was a crib in that window and there were paper decorations on it and there was a radiance of angels in that window and there was a radiance of angels in the house. And um, tonight, later on, I was a little lad of five. Tonight, later on, a man with a bag of miracles on his back would come and maybe maybe the three wise men would pass our way, you know, and leave their hoof tracks outside in our lawn or outside in our field. Field. And so there was a lovely glow of fellow feeling. And in that glow of fellow feeling, I remember crossing the yard to the cow stall. And I stood on in the cow stall door and I looked in and I was in collision with something terrible. Not in collision with something that was there. I was in collision with something that wasn't there. Because when the little lad of five that I was then looked into the stall, it wasn't Christmas night in the stall. Um, you know, there was no paper decorations, there was no crib, um, there was no holly and ivy, there was no expectation that the man of miracle, with a bag of miracles on his back would come, there was no expectations that maybe camels would come through those three doors in the night. And I was devastated. 
because like I'd grown up in that yard and you know we shared the yard with the horses and with the pigs and with the, the hens and the ducks and the geese and with the cows and the calves like and the little lad I was like thought that if it's Christmas night in the dwelling house where human beings li- live then it'll be Christmas night in the stall as well and then I walked back kind of devastated but I didn't quite know how to deal with what had happened to me but when I was 19 and I was studying philosophy in Dublin I came back again it was Christmas Eve and we had plenty of turf you know but um, I wanted to go out into the fields and get a bath of sticks so that tonight we wouldn't the fire wouldn't only look great it would sound good as well because we'd have the sound of the sticks crackling away in the fire so out I went and I got into Mikey Fitz's fields and I got a great bath of sticks and I was tightening the rope uh, on this bath of sticks and I looked beside me there, and there beside me was a white thorn bush and there was a little robin in the bush and again the old feeling came down Christ the robin doesn't know it's Christmas Eve it hasn't decorated the bush with holly and ivy like and I looked away at the moon coming up and the moon didn't have holly and ivy in its window and so I was back into the old desolation and now I was able to articulate what was happening to me Uh, like you know human beings are alone in their story we are alone in our story the animals don't share our story with us the cows and the calves and the robins and the moon and the sun doesn't share our story and I felt that desperate desolation you know and that desolation lived with me for years and I thought back to the little lad I was when I was five (coughs) and I went across to the stall didn't I in a state of we feeling didn't I like we meaning us human beings my sisters and brothers my father and mother but every cow in the stall, the pigs, the hens, the ducks, that was the we feeling. I came back into the house in a state of us and them feeling. Some incredible gulf had opened in the yard. You know, so instead of we, we are now saying us and them. And the day any, the day any sexual universe or any parts of the universe become them, that is the day like that they become objects and you know they're you, you look at them objectively and you almost can look at them and study them scientifically you're looking then is almost sometimes voyeuristic you know instead of instead of empathy you are now looking at them objectively and you keep them at arm's length so that incredible kind of disaster that happened to me there that night the, the fall out of we feeling into us and them feeling But now I feel, after years in Connemara, that I am again back in a world of we feeling. And it might be like that that's what white buffalo calf woman really brought to the Sioux people. Like she brought we feeling to them instead of us and them. And the moment she brought we feeling, the moment the buffalo and the pronghorn, the moment they were all enfranchised again. And I'm not saying that we enfranchise the animals. (coughs) Because she came from the buffalo, white buffalo, she came from the buffalo people uh, to the human beings to help them in their distress. And so maybe it was her who enfranchised us. So, like, could we again walk back into we feeling? Could we walk out of us and them feeling? What are we to lose, like, by enfranchising everything? You know, and I remember being down in Kildare a few years ago. I was restoring a garden, an 18th century wall garden for Robert Guinness there, and um, um, I wasn't in the primordial universe there now because everywhere I looked, I saw human intention and purpose in the landscape, like, and that was, I was in exile there, if you like. Um, But the cows in the land, in the demean land, they would calve and shortly after they were calved, like the calves would be taken away to the mart and Maynooth. And I would hear the cows lowing all night. And there were times like when I would low with them, I would hear the cow lowing for a calf and I would low with that cow. And I wasn't calling for her particular calf, but what I was doing was calling for white buffalo calf woman to come back into Europe, to come back and bring six or seven seals breathing holes with her, to come back and bring six or seven sacraments with her so that we could again sacramentalize ourselves and stand sacramentally on the earth, so that we could breathe again transcendentally, you know, to do for us what she did for the Sioux. And there was one night when I was in my house in Connemara and... um, Lynn's little child was from next door. She came up and she said, you're wanted below on the phone. Uh, someone is going phoning from Germany. Uh, no, f- Brendan Flynn is phoning from Clifton and he'll be phoning back in five minutes. So I went down and Brendan Flynn phoned and he said, someone has phoned from Germany 
and that person was phoned from Dakota. And it was a friend of mine, an Indian friend of mine in Dakota, who had phoned a friend in Germany, and the friend in Germany had phoned Brendan Flynn, Brendan Flynn had phoned me to tell me that the white, the, the pipe, that white buffalo calf woman had brought in illo tempore, in the, creative, in the creative dream time of the beginning, because the creative dream time is always, all time is once upon a time time, that for the first time in a hundred years they were taking down that pipe again, and they were going to do a pipe ceremony tonight. You know, and I just heard the news in time, so I opened my door, even though the wind was blowing straight in that door, I opened that door, and I draped a, a star blanket that I was given from an Akota Sioux Indian. It has a great eight point of star in it and uh, that is the star that your grandmother will probably make for you if, if you're a Sioux Indian and you will go on your vision quest dressed in that star blanket and you will die when you die you will be draped in that star blanket again can you imagine like the star that the stood above Bethlehem like that that's there in your blanket and you wrap yourself in it the idea of wrapping yourself in a star you know in a star that might stand still above some other Bethlehem under which God and humanity will again have met like. So I wrapped myself in that star blanket and all night long I called for white buffalo calf woman to come back into our world, you know, to come back and to roll to roll on our European earth and be a red buffalo and get up a beautiful woman but continue to walk towards us. She would roll and be a brown buffalo and get up a beautiful woman and still come towards us. She would roll and be a black buffalo. She would roll and be a white buffalo calf and come back to us because the story is that she will come back four times just as she has four legs. Now, what I love about that story is that she is both buffalo and woman. Do you know what I mean? It's as if the old terrible divisions, like when we look at the book of Genesis, the creation, you feel that there's Berlin walls, don't you, between each day of creation. But here she is both buffalo and woman. And she. so we talk about her as buffalo people. There's another lovely story. Can I just tell you a little story that I didn't intend to tell? But it's a story that's that isn't only found in North America, it's found in Eurasia as well. It's a story of a hunter. He lives alone in a small house and he lives in a great solitude and he goes off hunting every day. One day he comes back and, my God, he sees smoke from his house and he goes in and um, there's a lovely hot meal prepared for him and he looks out the back and he sees that his hunter's clothes that he'd worn yesterday, they were, hung, they were washed and hung out to dry. And he comes back the next evening from his hunting and again there is smoke from his chimney and again he goes in and there's a warm meal prepared for him and his leggings of the previous day are hanging out and a third day this, he comes back and the same thing happens. But then the fourth day, having gone out, he circles back. back to, he goes off into the distance but then he turns back towards his own house and he hides in the bushes watching and he sees a fox trotting up to his door and going through the door and he comes back in uh, he goes into the house and he sees a woman inside and a fox skin or a fox pelt hanging from a nail, if you like, at the back of the door. And she says, I am now your wife and I will be living with you from now on. So she was the fox who was now a human being. And he lived with her and he went off hunting every day and came back and she would have the meals ready for him and they got on very well. But then one day he started complaining about a smell of fox in the house that he found um, not greatly tolerable. He couldn't tolerate it after a while. And then one day when he found the fox smell intolerable, he, she just went and took down her fox skin. She put, draped it over her shoulders. She became a fox and she trotted off into the woods. Again, like, <clears throat> there are times, like, when I want that to be my E equals MC squared. Do you know what I mean? I just listen to that story, and I don't know, and I don't want to analyse it, but somehow I feel listening to it that I, I'm, I'm clear to the genius, I'm near to the genius of the universe. Do you know what I mean? Does it, does it set up some echo in you? You know, that, that, like, we live in a world of terrible fixed species and Berlin walls between all the species, doesn't, don't, don't we? This whole story suggests, like, that all, all our personalities, all our natures are really masks, in a way. Because these first peoples of the world, if they were to put on a lion mask or put on a raven mask, they read, the moment they put on the raven mask with the beak and the feathers, they became raven. 
Do you know, they were no longer a human being. They were then a raven. If you put on a buffalo robe and buffalo skull and buffalo horns, you and did a buffalo dance, then you were buffalo. You know, you had ceased to be human and you were buffalo. So I love this sense that 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 the species, far from being fixed, they are interchangeable. And if if I am just my person, my empirical personhood, that is really a mask assumed for the moment by the one great spirit. There is one universal great spirit and it wears many masks and the masks are interchangeable. Is that a terrifying vision of the universe or is it a beautiful vision of the universe? I don't know. I only know that when I hear that story about the mysterious housekeeper, it is sometimes called, about the fox who is fox and who is also woman, I think it is a wonderful story and it is a pity that the poor man wasn't able for his animal nature, like the fact that he, that he complained of the smell of vixen. It meant like that even though he was a great hunter, he still wasn't able for animal nature in him. He found the smell, I suppose, offensive. So this story of white buffalo calf woman, she's a white buffalo calf and she's a woman, I feel that some incredible wound that we live in, the wound of the subjective inside and the objective outside, some incredible wound is healed here. Like, suddenly... There is no distinction, to go back to the little story I was telling you, it is Christmas night in the stall, as well as in the dwelling house. And now I believe it is. Now I believe, like, and if the Christian story wishes to be the great story it is, or any story, any story that wishes to be a great story, it must literally include everything. I mean, there's no point in just being ecumenical towards Protestants or Catholics to be ecumenical towards Protestants. We have to be ecumenical towards animals, and we have to be ecumenical. We can only be ecumenical towards animals when we're ecumenical towards the animal in ourselves. The day you... The day you and... This isn't part of this. This isn't part of this set of stories now. But I do believe that after Gethsemane, that all that we inwardly are, in the person of Jesus, became religiously enfranchised, so that we can be now ecumenical towards all that we inwardly are, towards the animal in us. And until we are in, until we, until we are ecumenical towards the animal in us, how can we be ecumenical and live in a state of fellow feeling with the animals round about us? But the animals have withdrawn. I heard a, a statement about, uh, someone was telling me about someone from the Samburu tribe in Kenya. Someone went out to make a film out there and um, they used, these tribal people became, some of these tribal persons became actors and actresses in the film. And the tribe, the old, the old, the chief who was a young man who just inherited the chieftaincy, they brought him back to England um, to, uh, they flew him to England, to London, to see the premiere of this film. And he got onto the, tra- he got onto the plane, like, and he was given the numbers, like, so like a hunter, he just went down and tracked and he found something corresponding to the number 17, like, you know, um, this, this thing, and he sat down in the seat and apparently he arrived back to England anyway. But the two things that astonished him when he woke up in London was the houses on top of houses and where are all the animals? Can you imagine someone in Kenya, like in Serengeti, you know, and all the animals have gone from us Europeans. And the trouble is, like, they've taken their medicines with them. All the medicines that are in animals, they have taken them all. You know, the last bear in Ireland, the last wolf in Ireland. The wolf died, wolf medicine died with, with that last wolf. The last bear, whether it was the all, all we bear or what, the all we cave bear. Like, they went with their medicines and we are left alone now relying on the pharmaceutical companies, aren't we? You know, so white buffalo calf <coughs> woman, like, when I see a cow coming down the road in the morning and I'm going to work, like, is this her coming? You know, I mean, will she? Will this cow turn in and will it suddenly have a two-footed gait? Like, is this white buffalo calf woman coming back to heal us Europeans, to rescue us from us them feeling, and to reinitiate us into we feeling? So, can I maybe leave that story there? Is is that all right for a while? Like, just to to leave white buffalo calf woman. The Blackfoot dwell out in Montana like up against the Rockies, and that is big country. The last time I was in Canada, I went on a pilgrimage out to the Tongue River because Black Elk was a Sioux Indian, and at the age of nine, he had a a, a great vision. Uh, It was more than a vision. He was assumed into a heavenly world, and there um, great drama was enacted um, 
to be as big as Wagner's ring, if you like, in Bayreuth when it was an actor for him. And he was given the power to reheal, to heal the earth and to liberate the frozen earth, to set the waters free again. So they reenacted that great ritual that he saw in the heavens. They reenacted it on the earth beside the bank of the Tongue River. And I went out on a pilgrimage to the Tongue River. And on the way out, like... Um, you know, you're, you're often heard of Serengeti plains in Africa when, when the first rains are about to come, uh, or in the Kalahari, the first rains are about to come, the, 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 the skylines, the horizons are alive with lightnings, and the animals know it's going, there's going to be rain soon, and they're, in their millions they're on the move to where the rains are going to fall and the grass is going to come up. And, like, m- m- some of you will have seen maybe pictures of, of, the, of these millions of animals on the move. But as we went across to the Tongue River, it was the Serengeti Plain was up there in the sky because all the geese in great victories of them going north, and it wasn't just 24 or 25 geese in a victory, there'd be a couple of hundred geese, and all the ducks and all the swans. So I was looking up at what looked like a Serengeti above me. So, like... This is the, the tremendous world that um, the Blackfoot Indians would have grown up in. And in the mountains, there'd be cougars and there'd be bears. And um, you'd have pronghorn down below and elk. And uh, so it was a stupendous world. And um, we have to imagine a time when, before Europeans came, when they hadn't the horse. Now, they would walk out onto the prairie and they would see the great herd of buffalo. But buffalo, as you know, are great big beings, aren't they? They're, they're stupendous beings they aren't just big physically you get a sense that psychologically they are big they are they are big in a way that has nothing to do with their size they are big beings so how does a little what shakespeare would call like the bare forked animal that the human being is with his bow and arrow go out and take on these so a way they had was um, the shaman of the tribe or the medicine man of the tribe, he would pray for two nights, he would abstain from sexual togetherness with his wife or his wives, he would burn sweet grass, they would stay up with him and he would pray. And then one morning when he was ready, having ritually cleansed himself, he would put on a great buffalo robe and put on the great buffalo skull and he would climb the rock wall and walk out onto the prairie. And the herds of buffalo would be out there on the prairie and he would walk in such a way uh, and come sufficiently near them to attra- attract their attention and first the great bulls would, would raise their heads and look and they'd like cows they'd get very curious and once he'd attracted their attention the attention of the bulls and then of the cows he would turn and walk away and now that their curiosity was aroused they would start walking behind him because he looked like a buffalo because he had a buffalo robe and buffalo skull and he might even they might even get the smell of buffalo off him and uh, once he knew they were walking away then he would quicken his pace and walk faster and they would be walking faster and then he would break into a trot and he would finally be running and they would be running with him or behind him and all the time he would be running towards a great rock wall, towards a great precipice and out from the precipice there would be a kind of shoot or V-shaped set of structures like stones, clumps of stones and bushes and the people would be hiding behind those and when he had walked or ran into that V-shaped structure um, that was the point of it at right at the rock wall at the precipice um, when he would lure the buffalo into that then the people would get up from behind the rocks the, the, the heaps of rocks and the bushes and they would make a great clamor and a great noise and that would stampede the, the buffalo behind and they would push the ones in front ahead and they would come to the rock wall and all pour over it like a great waterfall down onto a corral below a corral of poles and posts below and they would break their backs and they would have a whole herd of buffalo, buffalo that they could then butcher and they would have meat for a winter. It happened among the Blackfoot Indians that a time came when the buffalo would come to the rock wall, would come to the precipice, but instead of pouring over it like a Niagara, um, they would break left and right and go down slow inclines and gamble away. It happened again and again and again. And a time came when now again there was hunger among the Blackfoot Indians and the old people were dying and there was a kind of low lamentations in the teepees. And a young girl in her adolescence, she one day found herself climbing the rock wall and walking out onto the prairie. And it wasn't so much that she said anything, she was kind of surprised to hear herself saying because she was now living from some profound need, from a depth, the disappearance of a people. She was now... She was now living from some tremendous depth inside of herself and she found herself saying... 
looking at a great herd of buffalo out there in the prairie, saying, if you would come, addressing the whole herd, if you would come and be food for the people, I would marry the chief one among you. And she had hardly said that, it went to her astonishment. The old great bull raised his great head and looked at her, and all the other bulls raised their head at their heads, and the cows raised their heads and cocked their tails and turned towards her, and they thundered across the prairie and thundered past her and over the rock wall down into the corral and broke their backs. And the people who were in the, in facing death in the teepees, they heard this great thundering across the prairies. And they came out and they saw what had happened, the great miracle had happened, and they came out and started butchering the the, the buffalo and it went on all night but sometime in the middle of the night or during the night a great bull a stupendous being he he jumped out over the corral wall and stood in front of the adolescent girl the girl who was still in her adolescence and said you promised that if, if we became food for the people that you would marry me because I am the chief one among this herd of this herd of buffalo, you must now come away with me. And she kind of recoiled in horror and terror at the idea, but he insisted, and he, as it were, like in the fairy story, he took her by the arm, led her up the rock wall and out onto the prairie. And sometime in the morning, the father of this girl realised that his daughter was gone, and he sank down into a kind of trance, and um, in the trance he saw her clairvoyantly moving up the rock wall and going out onto the prairie. So he got his quiver of arrows, uh, or his arrows, uh, his his quiver and put his arrows into it uh, and slung it at his back and up the rock wall he went and out onto the prairie and after walking there for a long while not knowing which direction to take he came to a buffalo wallow and he sat down by the buffalo wallow not knowing which, which way to go and he saw a magpie at the other side of it and he said what a magnificent bird and the magpie was delighted with the compliment and said indeed I am magnificent am I? I am magnificent and the man said yes and you'd even be more magnificent maybe if you would help me and the magpie said is there any way I'd be delighted to help you and the man said, told the story and said would you fly out there over the prairies and if anywhere overflying the herds of buffalo if you see a young woman among them among any herd will you drop down beside her and tell her that i her father am waiting for her at the buffalo wallow so off the magpie flew delighted and overflew a lot of the herds and finally <coughs> found a herd and yes that isn't a buffalo down there that's a young woman down there dropped down beside her and started nonchalantly pecking um, for insects in the ground and little bits of food in the fr- on the ground and then came slowly gradually uh, towards her and said your father is at the wallow and the uh, young woman said shh pointing to the great big being who was now the bull buffalo who was her husband don't wake him and um, she said I can't go now I can't go now he'll wake up and the magpie said you must come and she said no 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 if I go now they'll miss, miss me gone because he won't be asleep for long more he'll miss me gone and they'll come after us and kill us tell him to wait for an opportunity and the opportunity will present itself and I'll come and after a while the magpie flew off and um, after a while the old bull her husband he woke up and he was thirsty like, and he called for water and she went over being an obedient squaw in a sense she went over and she took down a great horn from off his great buffalo head and off she went to the wallow and the father said to her when she came to the wallow let's go now let's go now and she said no 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 he's thirsty now and he's waiting for the water and it took me longer to get here than I expected he's already waiting for me if if we go we won't make it back home they'll come after us and destroy us wait for a better opportunity so she came back with the horn full of water and she gave it to this great big bull and he took one great swallow of it you know, drinking it down into him, drinking it as much through his nostrils almost as through his mouth. And he smelt a human being and he made a great roar, having smelt a human being in the water. And he pawed the earth and his tail stood like a sea of the tree. And he took another swallow and again he roared and all the bulls roared. And he turned and he faced the wallow and all the bulls faced the wallow and all the cows faced the wallow. And then they were thundering across the prairies and they came to the wallow and they found the man there. And they bent down with their horns and they hooked him and they threw him in almost some kind of slow motion dance from horn to horn um, you know, right around the edge of the wallow from horn to horn he was thrown from bull's horn to bull's horn from cow's horn to bull's horn and in the end there were only bits of him on the ground and then they danced and trampled him till there was nothing he was invisible he was one with the mud and after a while 
the daughter, his daughter arrived and she saw what had happened and she just collapsed onto the earth and she started weeping. And all these great bulls were looking at her and the cows were looking at her and they were astonished that a human being might weep that a human being had those kind of feelings like that they could weep and the old big bull who was her husband came over and st- stood stood beside her and said you are weeping and I am sorry that you're weeping but we too weep we have killed your father and now you are weeping but your people have killed my grandfather my grandmother you have killed my sister you have killed my aunt and killed three of my uncles there isn't one of us here who hasn't a cousin a father or mother or brother that your people haven't killed and when your people kill us we too feel pain we too feel the grief and in a, in now that they were having they, they had grief in common the old bull said to her maybe there's something we can do if you can regenerate and revive your father then we will let you go you and your father back to your people and the young girl saw the magpie and said um, still pecking around there or again pecking around there what a magnificent bird and the magpie said indeed I am magnificent and will you help me and the magpie said yes and the young girl said will you scratch around there with your claws and your beak and see if you can find any tiny little fragment of my father and bring it to me and the magpie scratched and scratched and pecked and pecked and finally found a little fragment of vertebrae and she brought it and dropped it at the girl's feet and the girl had a buffalo robe and she put her buffalo covered it laid it on the great and sacred earth on the ground and she covered it with her buffalo robe and she she sank down into herself chanting and she went down below her identity as a person below her identity as a Blackford Indian she sank down into the in, into those roots or depths within herself that we have in common with mountains and stars that we have in common with oceans that we have in common with all life on the earth that we have in common with the whole universe she was down there chanting and as she chanted it seemed that the whole universe was chanting with her and it took her a long she was down there a long time but finally she emerged and she came back into herself, into a sense of her own identity, into her hands and into her hair and into her, uh, into, 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 into the, the Blackfoot Indian that she was, a young adolescent Blackfoot Indian. And she rolled back the buffalo robe and to the astonishment of herself and of everyone, there was a father, complete in body, but still dead, not yet, not alive. So she again covered him with the buffalo robe and again she sank down into herself, down into the great depths of herself and she chanted and chanted and chanted and it seemed to go on for, well, this wasn't time at all, sure. I mean, when you chant that profoundly and that deeply, you're not in time, you're, you're in eternity somewhere, you're in the eternal world. And again she came back into time and into her own identity and she rolled back the robe and there was a father alive and he stood up and the bulls and the cows the buffalo were astonished at the great power that the people have and um, that human persons can sometimes have and um, they said yes we will keep our promise we promised you that if you could revive your father that you we would allow you and your father to go back to your people but we would like to give you something before you go we would like to give you our song and our dance so that you might take it back to your people and um, the man and the woman said yes they'd be quite happy they'd be happy indeed you know to to learn their song and the dance and then the buffalo great big beings they look so ponderous but they aren't at all ponderous because when they break into their dance they're in the sun they're walking the earth now in the sun dance way and when you walk the earth in the sun dance way like you know you aren't you aren't damaging a blade of grass even though you set foot on the blade of grass you aren't damaging it so they broke into this great dance and after a while it seemed that the constellations that the mountains were, were dancing with them that they that it was a one piece of choreography that the mountains were dancing with them, the shadows of the mountains were dancing with them, the constellations were dancing with them. This was the song that the universe is, and this was the dance that the universe is. This wasn't just the buffalo song and the buffalo dance. It was their song and their dance, but it was also the dance that the universe and that the stars are manifestations of. And the man and the woman broke into this dance and they learned the dance and slowly, slowly, slowly they came back out of the eternity of that dance into time. And they looked at each other and they knew, yes, they could see that the man and the woman, the young woman, had learned this buffalo song and this buffalo dance. And they said, now go back 
and they went back and they came home greatly enriched because now they came back with the buffalo song and the buffalo dance and that's how Blackfoot Indians say to this day they dance the buffalo the buffalo dance and sing the buffalo song that's their that's their account of the most sacred ritual that they perform now can I just say that to me when I came to Connemara that was a great story that came through my door one day you know I mean it came in a book like but it was a great story because in Connemara like where I live like I could look up the Rada Hill and there are no fences it's all commonage you know, commonage land, so that all the families of the farmers of that townland will send their cattle in common onto that land. Um, now, I sometimes think, like, that to go back to what I was saying a while ago about um, the Christian creation story, you feel there's a Berlin Wall between each day of creation. Now, what this story seems to talk to me about is commonage consciousness. You know, that there is one consciousness, one universal consciousness, and it is there in buffalo, it is there in otters, it is there in trees, it is there in rocks, it is there in stoats, and there really are no fences between us. And the thing about this story is that this might well have been told in Altamira and Lascaux. I mean, this story might have been told in the cave mouth of Altamira or in the cave mouth of Lascaux 25,000 years ago, 40,000 years ago in Europe and then it migrated across Eurasia and went across the Bering Straits and went down and, and survived among the Blackfoot Indians. I mean, this might well be our own story. And what D.H. Lawrence says, like I seem to be quoting D.H. Lawrence a lot tonight, but he does say that, um, that if some new future is to be born for us, we have to go back into all states of consciousness, not in the form of decadence and regression, but to go kind of back consciously to these old level. All these old levels of consciousness are still alive in us, and we have to go back and then come forward again. You know, from those old states of consciousness. It seems to me, looking at uh, going behind Europa's Europe you know, the Europe of Europa, uh, which had its origin in the Mediterranean somewhere and came north and um, we are still living within the Hadrian's Wall, you know, so that in pre-Europa's Europe, the consciousness of Altamira and Lascaux was commonage consciousness. And it seems to me that it is only in commonage consciousness that the earth can be saved. We have to take down the fences between us and animals. We have to take down the fences between us and stars. We have to acknowledge the oneness of consciousness that is in the universe. If we don't, we're going to be still in that world of us and them, and they are inferior and we are superior. If we could only once break back <coughs> into we feeling, if we could only once break back into into commonage consciousness, then we had a chance. We would be incredibly enriched. We would be so stupendously enriched, and so would the animals be enriched uh, by the fact that we now could share the one earth with them. Now, this isn't only what that story is saying. That story is saying lots of other things. I mean, it is saying that um, there really is no death. I mean, there is death, but death isn't in any way final. Like, you know, that, that even though the man was just, there was just a little fragment of bone left, the complete human being was reborn from that stone, uh, from that little fragment of bone. So, I mean, what the story is saying is that you have killed, you have killed aunts and uncles of ours, but each animal that you have killed can be reborn. There's a lovely, I think I once heard it, and I don't know if I've got this right now, about Eskimos, like where they would stand at a seal's breathing hole, you know, waiting, waiting for a seal to rise. And when, when the feather that they have placed there in the seal's breathing hole would move, they would know then the seal was ri rising and they would launch their harpoon and they would haul it out onto the snow, onto the ice. And then whoever had, had caught the seal would call to the others who'd be standing at their seal's breathing holes and they would come. And as I remember it, they would open the side of the seal and take out the liver and they would cut it into a few, say, if there were five of them there, five little fragments of this and they would eat it, I suppose, it wouldn't be wrong to say, eucharistically. And they would thank the seal for 
offering itself to be food for the people because all hunting peoples believe that if an animal doesn't want to be caught, you don't catch it. You know, an animal that you, that you, that you, that you wound or an animal that you kill has decided to offer itself to be food to the people. So they will, eating its river, its liver raw, they will talk to the spirit of the seal and they will say to the seal, thank you for offering yourself to be food to the people. But do you now go back to that place where spirits take on a new body, take on a new body and come back again into the world. Like, that is so much more beautiful as a way of relating to animals, isn't it? You know, I mean, I was once blowing Galway Station waiting to go somewhere, and there's a slaughterhouse right beside Galway Railway Station, bus station, and a truck had come and dumped a load of cattle, what else could you call it, but a load of cattle onto a ramp there. And very shortly they were going to be fed into the machines, into the great chainsaws or whatever you like to call them, like they were going to be sliced. And there was one old old bullock there, like, with her head across an iron railing, and she looked kind of stupefied, away from her fields, away from the side of the mountain. And I just wanted to go over and throw my arms around that stupefied head, like, maybe it wasn't stupefied, and ask it to forgive us, like, for what we were doing to it. Because our relationship with it was all wrong. Like, in the Christian tradition, it is it is common, I think, uh, to say that you can only sin against another human being or sin against God. You cannot sin against an animal. You cannot sin against a river. You cannot sin against a blade of grass. You can sin against anything. I mean, Christians, we have to open up and say that you can be in a state of sin towards a blade of grass. You can be in a state of sin towards the AIDS virus. To see a tree, to look at a tree and see only cubic feet of timber, that is to sin against the tree. When you see anything as smaller or less than what it is, you are sinning against it. When you see something only with an economic eye, you are sinning against it. So what they are saying, the the buffalo there, that buffalo, the the buffalo song, the buffalo dance, how it came to the Blackfoot Indians, you know, they are saying here that death isn't final, that you can go back, the spirit is left intact, the spirit hasn't been wounded by that spear, and that spirit can go back and take on a new body, a body of its choice maybe, and come back again. There are all kinds of levels of meaning in that story, but I only want to say that it is time now in Western Europe to reinstitute commonage consciousness. We have to reinstitute it in the way that you would inst- institute a new sacrament. And unless I feel, unless we reinstitute commonage consciousness, then we're going to continue to do appalling damage to the earth. So that, it seems to me, is a story that could take us into an ecologically better way of being on the earth. Um, So that, like, when I go back and look at Dorada Hill and see no fences... I mean, a couple of years ago, there was all this big talk about taking down the Berlin Wall between two socio-political systems, you know, that human beings had set up, capitalism and communism, you know. Taking down that Berlin Wall is no big deal. It is hugely important, though, that we take down the Berlin Wall between us and blades of grass, between us and trees, between us and, and stars, between us and everything that is. And the lovely thing is that these human beings, like when the buffalo said to these human beings, we would like to teach you our song and our dance, they didn't say, Christ, what do you mean? Like, you, you with your IQ teaching us with our IQ? You know, they didn't have that attitude. Like, they were willing to receive the gift. They didn't, they didn't see the difference between them and the buffalo. They saw, they saw what was common between them and the buffalo. And what is common is great. What, what separates us is, in a, in a way, maybe trivial. But what we have in common is great and immense. So maybe that is a story that could take us by the hand or we could reach out our hand and ask that story take us back from our us and them consciousness back into commonage consciousness back into we feeling and then we will be walking the earth in a more beautiful way and can I just say that the earth is not going to reveal itself or the universe is not going to reveal itself to someone who is a scientist just a scientist or to someone who is a theologian the earth will reveal itself only maybe to the Francis of Assisi who walks out naked into it like and says brother sun and sister moon and what else is this story what else is this Blackfoot Indian story but an amplification of St Francis of Assisi's attitude isn't it Uh, like you know it's a Franciscan story it's a story that the Francis Franciscans could rediscover their charism in and through that story. Like, so 
you know, brother sun, why not say brother sun? Why not say sister moon? Why not say sister death? Why not say brother fire? Why not say mother, mother, mother air? Like, do you know what I mean? And not only that, but like to go further than that again, the distance, there can still be a, a distance between brother and sister. To talk about what we have in common, common edge consciousness, you know, like to be Franciscans. To be Franciscans in a kind of, not, not so much in a European way, but almost in an Indian way, but as D.H. Lawrence says, we can't cluster at the drum anymore. But we could at least do that, couldn't we? We could at least allow commonage consciousness to take hold of us again and to live from that. And that, it seems to me, is the story in and through which, in Europe... And it might, the wonderful thing is that it might be, well, a pre-Europa European story. You know, it might have been told in Lascaux and Altamira. So that, as D.H. Lawrence says, to go back in a great arc into the past and come forward. If we come forward with that story, and not just as a story, if we let that story live in us, and we dance, sing the buffalo song and dance the buffalo dance, if we sing the, if we sing the sycamore song and dance the sycamores uh, dance, if we sing the All We Cave Bears song and dance his dance, then we will be immensely and immeasurably the better for that. We will begin to walk the earth in a sacred way and it is only to someone who walks beautifully on the earth that the earth will reveal itself. The earth won't reveal itself because you go into a lab and crash bits of it together or put bits of it in a test tube. It will reveal itself only to someone who walks beautifully on it. I suppose like the way to draw near another people is maybe to listen to one of their sacred stories or to listen to their sacred story. And I'm presuming tonight, I suppose, to tell the sacred stories of people. And that is a great way. If you tell it with great reverence, that's a way of taking down a Berlin wall of misunderstanding and incomprehension maybe between you and the the people whose sacred story it is. I'd like now to tell a sacred story of the Eskimo. They call themselves now the Inuit, the people. Takana Kapsaluk was her name. She's known sometimes as Sedna. She has other names, but Takana Kapsaluk was the name by which I first came to know her. And she was the one who wouldn't marry. And her father got very cross and very angry about this. And one day in, he wrote her out in his kayak out into the great ocean and he threw her overboard and then turned to row back home, leaving her there to the ocean. And she reached for the gunnels on the side of the kayak uh, to haul herself back in. But he just chopped off her fingers and she sank away and the fingers floated in the ocean. Now, this was dream time. This was the creative dream time of the beginning. Um, when things turn into each other, it's an infinitely creative universe. So her fingers floating there in the ocean, they became the sea mammals, the sea beasts. They became walrus and dolphins and whales and porpoise and all the other sea mammals. And uh, she sank down into the floor of the ocean and a house grew round her down there. And she is mother of sea mammals. She is the mother of sea beasts. And it happens that when the people who are on the surface of the earth, when they don't walk, in the great imagination, when they, when they don't walk beautifully on the earth, when they don't walk greatly on the great earth, when they sin, when they perform abortions, when they, have, when they do things like that that are against the great imagination, a wall of anger grows round her down below on the floor of the ocean. All the sea beasts go back down and they remain within the wall and the people will be out hunting, standing at seals, breathing holes, waiting for a seal to rise and day after day no seal will come. Uh, Night after night no seal will come. Month after month no seal will come. And there will be hunger again among the people. And the people one night will go then to the great shaman, to the great medicine man, because only the greatest of medicine (coughs) men can handle this situation. And they will drum for him. And he will, as they drum for him, he will he will gradually sink into a trance and he will set out on a great journey. He was He's going to be on a journey now down to the great floor of the ocean and um, this is a very dangerous journey because it isn't just a, homo- a journey through homogeneous space. He will go through very different kinds of states of mind, each state of mind being a different state of the world because at that depth, state of mind and state of world are one state and he will come to the crashing rocks um, and the only way through is through these crashing rocks so he must know exactly when to move through otherwise he's going to get crushed by the rocks and he will come to a mountain up over which 
great cliff wall up over which there's only one ladder, only one way up, and that is a ladder of uh, whose rungs are knives. And sometimes the knives are on the flat, but sometimes they turn and they, they, they're on their edge. And if he goes up and they turn on their edge, then his, his feet are just going to get um, so, so wounded that he won't be able to go on. And having climbed that mountain, he will then come to a river. Um, and at the other side of the river, there will be something like a lapwing person and that lapwing person or a seal person will be wounded and he will want pity in him and compassion in him will want to cross the river to help her but if he goes across then he's finished that's the end of his journey this is a lure to get him across and he will never again be able to break free from the power of this um, person this seal person or lapwing person who is evil uh, who is in fact a kind of witch so it's a a hazardous journey and it's a kind of as the Greeks would say it's a hodos chameleontos as well and only the great shaman can know the great medicine man can find his way in this world and finally he will come to the great wall of anger that has grown round about Takana Kapsaluk and the sea beasts but even through the great wall of anger he will hear the sea beasts inside with their great breathing he can hear them breathing and she's inside and her, fa- her hair is infested with lice her hair now the great Takana Kapsaluk uh, her hair is infested with the sins of the people and this is why the wall of anger has gone, gone, grown round about her and he will stand beside this wall of anger and he will call out he will sing in a whale song he will sing in a wolf voice he will sing in a walrus voice, in all the voices of nature he will sing and uh, he will. He, uh, his singing will be a kind of calling to her and gradually the wall of anger will get thinner and thinner and finally it will open and he will go in and he has brought an ivory comb with him a comb of walrus ivory and he will start combing her great hair her great head of hair down over her seal's shoulders down over her whale's shoulders down over her walrus shoulders down over her porpoise shoulders he will be combing her hair combing out the lice and as the lice are are being combed out of her hair she's getting more and more relaxed she's getting more and more appeased and finally he will have combed it all out and the wall of anger will then have have disappeared completely and the seals and the walrus and the sea mammals they will all be rising and he will set out on his great journey back. And the people who are waiting in the igloo, they will hear him coming from afar off. They will hear his voice coming from a long, long way away, and then not so far away. And finally, he will return and re-enter his body on the teepee floor and he will tell them that his voyage was successful, that his journey down to the floor of the ocean was successful and that they can now go out hunting and the people will again get their huskies and their sleds and off they will go and the seals will be rising and there will be food for the people. That is the story, like an Eskimo story. Now, I mean, we can, I suppose, think of her as the great mistress of life, as the great mother of life and we haven't in Europe been walking in the great imagination. And maybe <coughs> down in the depths of our psyches, think of it, the shaman's journey, the medicine man's journey, that's somewhere down in the depth of our own psyches, which is, which is one with the universe anyway, that somewhere there, there is a mother of archetypes, or a mother of great visions, or a mother of, of, of great intuitions. And a wall of anger has grown round that. And only someone who will undertake a journey down into the depths of his or the depths of her psyche and sing there with a whale voice and a dolphin voice and a, a, an elk voice, an otter's voice or a stoat's voice like can break down that so that the great life can again begin to emerge up into us, can again rise into the surface consciousness um, and that we will again be walking in the great imagination and in the great world. There is a sense, isn't there, in which in the 20th century without, as Tyler de Chardin, would say, as we were talking about ago about de Chardin, our noise sphere. Like you don't hear the great imagination coming out of our televisions, coming out of our radios coming out of all the media, the print media or the electronic media, you don't hear the great imagination. We aren't walking in the great imagination. We are walking in our desert of Zin. And like the people in, in, in the, the children of Israel, um, the Israelites, their souls were dried away. Our souls were dried away. So it is time that someone among us would go down to the, the floor of the ocean, would go down to the floor of the psyche and sing there with 
the commonage voice with all the voices of nature and comb out to can a capsuluk's hair. I mean, isn't that a lovely idea, like with a comb of walrus ivory, combing out the sins of the people, sins against grass, sins against elk, sins against stars, sins against rivers. Comb them all out. I sometimes imagine Kathleen e. Houlihan, like, where is Kathleen e. Houlihan in the depth of the, of the Irish psyche? And someone would go down there, like... We don't need a Cúhollán. We don't need, like, a Fergus. We need someone who... A medicine man or a medicine woman. Someone who can go to Cundle as well. Go to where Kathleen Houlihan is and with a comb of walrus ivory, comb our sins out of her hair. I can imagine Europa, you know, who will go down and comb and comb Europa's hair. The, the Europe we're supposed to be joining. Who will comb Europa's hair? Comb Cartesianism out of it. Comb the Medusa mindset out of it. Comb all our, our economic seeing out of it. So that, again, like the great European Earth can, again, be present to us and we can walk among the animals in the way that maybe our Paleolithic ancestors walked among them in commonage consciousness. So... It's possible that Kathleen E. Houlihan's hair is infested with the sins that we have committed and that um, Europa's hair and we need a medicine man or a medicine woman to go and appease her so that we can again walk the stupendous great earth, the great and sacred earth, in a great and sacred way. That's just a little Eskimo story, you know. Just think of her maybe as a mother of archetypes, a mother of visions, a mother of insights, a mother of sacraments. Um, You know, again, like we need to be, we need to be in touch beautifully and sacramentally with the depths of the psyche. Just as like we have to be in touch with, with, you would sometimes feel, wouldn't you, that some people that they aren't in touch with the depths of the psyche. And maybe that's a good thing, because it's a dangerous thing to be in touch with, like to be in touch with those levels and those depths. But maybe we do need an odd medicine man and a medicine woman who, on our behalf, will be in touch with it. Not every Eskimo or Inuit will go down. Only the greatest of shaman will go down to that, that, floor of, that floor of the ocean. So again, like, to go down and to do what Freud or the psychoanalyst can't do for us, you know, Freud went down there and saw the id. I mean, the Eskimos see this wall of anger, but it is enclosing the the animals of which we live. Like it isn't; they aren't id animals. They are beautiful beings, you know. And then they rise, and we're in touch with each other again. So think of them as instinctive life in us, that we would go down into instinct, the depths of instinctive life in us, and be able to trust that she is the mother of instincts, she is the mother of sea beasts, she is the mother of mammals, she is the mother of great intuitions and great archetypes, she is the mother of our greatest dreams, like, and that a time might come when there'd be no seals breathing hole between consciousness and unconsciousness, and that would be calamity, wouldn't it? You know, so that what is a shaman, what is a medicine man? He are, are a medicine person. I mean, a medicine person is someone in whom inwardly there is a seal's breathing hole so that he can be in touch with the depths of the universe in him and the depths of the psyche. And these people we need, and we need to live from those depths. Because if we live from the mathematical forefront of our brain, like, we are in trouble, you know, we are desperately in trouble then. This is a story about the origin of agriculture, and it's an Ojibwe story. Let's imagine a time when there were great hunters among the Ojibwe and uh, these were mighty men because in order to be a warrior or a hunter you had to be a mighty man. But there was one family among the Ojibwe and the man of the house was kind of a dreamer and he would go into the woods in the day or go out hunting in the day and he wouldn't arrive home. He'd arrive home with his hands empty. So very often like his family was hungry and um, they would have to live on the charity of other people. His son grew up, like, and uh, as he was growing up, he yearned, you know, to restore the family pride, and he thought when he become a man, like, he would be a mighty warrior or a mighty hunter. And uh, so when he came, when it came for him to go out on his vision quest, he was delighted, and off he went. He was taken by his grandfather out into the, out into the wilderness, and he, they dug the vision pit for him. And he sank down into the vision pit, and he would have to remain there for four days and four nights without food or without water 
or possibly maybe with some bit of water. And his grandmother would be praying for him and his grandfather would be praying for him and he would have had, I suppose, he would have gone in before he went, he would have uh, undergone tremendous purification in, uh, in the sweat lodge. So now he was in the vision pit and the hope was that maybe he would dream a great dream or have a vision and that would be the dream would have healing in it or medicine in it for his people. So after the first night he didn't dream, the second night he didn't dream, the third night this boy didn't dream and yearningly the fourth night he, at the end of it he hadn't dreamed and he just walked away into a clearing in the wood and to his astonishment he saw a sky being coming down all tassels and plumes and the sky being challenged him to a wrestling match and they wrestled all day and this little boy was hungry now and weak because he hadn't eaten or, uh, for, for four days but somehow below his weakness there was tremendous strength, it was an, almost a kind of earth strength and when he wrestled with the sky being it was almost as if the earth and the sky were wrestling together and and at the end of the day, the sky being broke off and said, tomorrow we wrestle again. And yet the next day, uh, the young boy was there early in the morning. And again, the strength was in him and they wrestled all day. And a third day, they wrestled all day. And at the end of the third day, the sky being all tassels and plumes, he had weakened and he was about to die from his exertions. But before he died, he said to the, to the boy, there's something you must do. Dig a great, clear a patch of ground, dig a trench and bury me in it. And you and your father must come back into this and keep it clean of weeds. So the boy went home and uh, he persuaded his father to come to the clearing every day and they kept it clear of weeds and then one day they saw new beautiful shoots, 50 or 60 beautiful shoots coming up and this was the new plant, this was corn, this was maize if you like and when that was ripe it would have the tassels and the plumes uh, of, uh, of, of the corn and the maize that people would, would so love in the North American world. So this is a very short story of how corn came to the Ojibwe people, uh, how they would have, in a sense, moved over to some extent from the hunter-gatherer stage to this stage of agriculture. Now, what I want to draw attention to in that is that the corn, if you like, I've been talking earlier on in these stories about enfranchising the universe, enfranchising the blade of grass, enfranchising everything. In this story, the corn is in fact a person, and it is born out of a person. It is a person like unto ourselves, except that the person is uh, is from the sky. And it is born, agriculture is born out of a wrestling between heaven and earth, and I kind of love that, that idea. Now, in ancient Greece, um, the corn was also a person, and in the whole eastern Mediterranean, the whole Mediterranean world, and even in not only in ancient Greece but in Europe, we talk about the, scor- the corn spirit or the corn goddess. But in Greece, if we just confine ourselves to Greece for the moment, I mean, corn was the beautiful new corn coming up was Corre, was Persephone, and the the. And the maturing corn was the mater, so that it was a goddess, it was a divinity. And the earth itself was Gaia, the earth itself was a divinity. Now, in the, in the test of the Old Testament, God is totally transcendent, isn't he? Now, and I think that is sometimes unfortunate, because it means that all value is now in the super-celestial world, all divine value, all value is divine value, and it's in the super-celestial world. And that means that the earth is just basically raw material, and we can look at it with an economic eye. But in this vision of it, the earth is itself a goddess, and the corn is, uh, is a goddess. Now, if the corn is a goddess, then I'm going to treat it sacredly. I'm going to respond uh, sacredly to it. I mean, when I take my sickle to the corn, I know I'm cutting down the goddess. When I, when I broadcast the seed, I know that it's the seed that, will, that, that is and will become a goddess that I'm, that I'm, that I, that, that I'm broadcasting. So, but for us, we have totally depersonalized corn. It has just become another economic an economic proposition, an economic thing, an economic entity, economic raw material for us. And that is a pity. And when I think of the corn like as 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 just a goddess, like that reminds me of Wordsworth. Remember Wordsworth's idea was that in the beginning, like trailing clouds of glory do we come. Do you know the the, the poem, the famous Ode and the Intimations of Immortality, where Wordsworth says our birth is but asleep and a forgetting. The soul that rises with us, our life star, hath had elsewhere its setting and cometh from afar, not in entire forgetfulness and not in other nakedness, but trailing clouds of glory do we come from God who is our home. 
Heaven lies about us in our infancy, shades of the prison house begin to close upon the growing boy. But he behold the light and whence it flows, he sees it in his joy. The youth who daily farther from the east must travel is still his nature's priest, and by the vision splendid is on his way attended. At length the man perceives it die away and fade into the light of common day. Like we all, in a sense, have had our origins in an eternal world from God who is our home and then we come down into the prison house of the body and eventually we, we fade into the light of common economic day, of common, e- uh, of common commercial day. And I suppose about a century and a half before Wordsworth, Thomas Traherne, you know, had a wonderful passage, you'll remember it, the corn is orient and immortal wheat, remember it. Um, this is how it goes. The corn was orient and immortal wheat, which never should be reaped, nor was ever sown. I thought it had stood from everlasting to everlasting. The dust and stones of the street were as precious as gold. The gates were at first the end of the world. The green trees, when I saw them first through one of the gates, transported and ravished me. Their sweetness and unusual beauty made my breast leap, and almost mad with ecstasy. They were such strange and wonderful things. The men... Oh, what reverend and venerable creatures did the aged seem, immortal cherubims, and young men glittering and sparkling angels and maids, maids, strange seraphic pieces of life and beauty, boys and girls tumbling in the street and playing were moving jewels, and knew not that they were born or should ever die, but all things abided eternally as they were in their proper places. Eternity was manifest in the light of day, and something infinite behind everything appeared, which talked with my expectation and moved my desire. The city seemed to stand in Eden, or to be built in heaven. The streets were mine, the temple was mine, the people were mine. Their clothes of gold and silver were mine, as much as their sparkling eyes, their skins and ruddy faces. The skies were mine, and so were the sun and moon and the stars, and all the world was mine, and I the only spectator and enjoyer of it. I knew no churlish proprieties, no bounds, no divisions, but all proprieties and divisions were mine, all treasures and all possessions of them, so that with much ado I was corrupted and made to learn the dirty devices of the world, which now I unlearn and become, as it were, a little child again, that I may enter into the kingdom of God. I, I was told a story there the other evening about a man who was down in Dingle in the, in, in, in the southwest of Kerry, and... It was a lovely, gorgeous evening, and um, the mountains were almost heartbreakingly lovely and blue, and it was a silent, silent evening. The only sound was the sound of a stream tumbling down a schlieve on other. And one man, a visitor, was talking to a local man, and he, he drew attention, like he said, isn't the sound of the tumbling water wonderful? And the old man, um, the local man, said... Uh, I mean, it is calling us into the eternity out of which it is itself coming, out of, of which it is itself flowing. And like the eternity of that stream coming down Shlieve and is calling us into isn't an eternity that is behind time. It is an eternity that is right there in front. Do you know what I mean? I mean, it is the same eternity that Wordsworth talks about here in the order and the intimations of immortality, the same eternity that Traherne is talking about. So, like... To go back to what I was saying, the corn is orient and immortal wheat. And, I mean, at the time, maybe, uh, like, could I maybe just live with this for a little bit longer? I mean, at the end of the 19th century, do you remember when white people were scattering across uh, the in Manifest Destiny, pursuing this business of Manifest Destiny that was spreading across the North American continent. And um, they, they, came into the, they came into the Black Hills, Pahasapa, the holy sacred mountains of the Sioux Indians. So an old life, a great life, was being destroyed there. And somewhere down in California, in the valleys of California, a man named Vovoka, during... Uh, during an eclipse one day, he ascended into heaven and he kind of learned a dance there, a sacred dance, which uh, later became known as the ghost dance. And what would happen is people would dress in a ghost shirt, um, you know, a sacred, almost eternal shirt, a ghost shirt, and they would dance in great circles. And it was a kind of trance dance that would fall into trance trances. 
And what they were, it was an apocalyptic dance. What they were doing was they were going to roll the whole white world that we had brought with us um, in the way that you roll up a carpet and roll it off a floor. They would roll the white world, the Chicago's and the New York's. They would roll that off the North American continent. And the North American continent would then re- return to the way it originally was with the buffalo and the pronghorn and all of this. Like, So I think sometimes like that we have to, in Europe now, like seeing the corn purely as 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 economic opportunity, as economic material, or as bank checks or something like that, that we have to undertake a ghost dance ourselves and kind of ghost dance our ways of seeing things out of our eyes, ghost dance them out of our hands, ghost dance what Traherns called the light, or what Wordsworth calls the light of common day out of our eyes, ghost dance. What Traherne calls the dirty devices of the world, the dirty economic devices of the world, the philosophical as- assumptions and axioms, ghost dance in a sense, the Medusa mindset or the modern European mindset out of our eyes. Um, so that we can again see that the corn is orient and immortal wheat, so that we can walk ourselves enfranchised on an enfranchised earth. Now, I mean... <laughs> We live in the EEC, don't we? You know, the European Economic Community, like, and the Lord save us, like, if if in that world we could only remember uh, what the Greeks knew, if we could only recall to ourselves that the corn is immortal, that the corn is Demeter, that the corn is Persephone, or that the corn is a sky being um, that came down and that we wrestled with, and out of his death was born the corn. Like, if we could only remember that, how different agriculture would be, how different our relationship to the earth would be, how different. So we must unlearn, like Traherne, we must unlearn the dirty devices of the world. We must seek and return to an original, aboriginal innocence in relation to it all. Um, so that in our joy we can see things again, in, in a paradisal joy, because paradise isn't, isn't an elsewhere. Paradise is here where we are. All we have to do is ghost dance the dirty devices of the world out of our eyes, and when we look out again on the world, then it will be a kind of paradise. Uh, it won't be a paradise in which the wolf will lie down with the lamb. It won't be a paradise in which the lion will eat straw with the ox, but it will be paradise nonetheless and all the better maybe for the fact that the lion is a holy terror is a terror but maybe a holy terror um like blake talking about the roaring of lions the howling of wolves the destructive sword and the raging of the storm we see are portions of eternity too great for the mind of man but like we live in eternity we walk in eternity so agriculture which is a purely economic thing could be a blessed thing but I talked at the beginning about our eyes having become economic tumours. Let's ghost dance the philosophical assumptions and axioms out of those eyes. Let's ghost them out out of our fingers. I mean, I talked, do you remember the story, the Eskimo story, when I talked about Takana Kapsaluk, about he has to go down and comb out her hair, comb the lice, which are the sins that we commit. We commit sins when we don't walk in the great eternal worlds. Then we look at things, and the way we see things is a sin against things, and the shaman has to go down and comb out, you know, the lice, which are out of Takana Kapsaluk's hair, to comb out our sins out of Takana Kapsaluk's hair. I mean, we need the ghost dance in Europe. We need that ivory comb. I can imagine that ivory comb like a walrus ivory washed up on a beach, on an Arctic beach. And, um, and we could take, carve it into a comb and we would comb out our eyes. We would comb our eyes out, like our comb the dirty devices of the world out of our eyes, comb the dirty devices out of our hair, comb the economic ways of seeing things out of our hearing and out of our fingertips and out of, out of our seeing. So maybe we need a ghost dance in Europe and we need maybe, you know, that ivory comb, you know, so that we can again look through the eyes of Traherne, which were originally our own eyes, the corn was orient and immortal wheat, which never should be reaped, nor ever was sown. I thought it had stood from everlasting to everlasting. I mean, and that man and Kerry talking about the stream, the sound of the stream, like he heard the eternity of the stream. It is calling us into the eternity out of which it is itself flowing. We live in an eternal, immortal, tremendous world. And mortality, our mortality, is an exquisite way, if you like, of experiencing our immortality. You know, there are two ways of experiencing your immortality. You can experience it immortally, or you can experience your immortality mortally. And we have been given the privilege of bodies and hearing and seeing in those bodies, which enable us, in a sense, to experience that immortality 
motley and therefore exquisitely. So is that kind of, will we leave that maybe story there? You seem a small bit worried, Mary. Uh, I, I mean, are you, <laughs> are you troubled by some of this? Well, I suppose, John, your initial statement is worrying me in relation to what you said about Genesis. I think there are other ways of interpreting that text than the literal. You're talking about, yeah, you're talking about uh, Genesis 1, verses 26 and 28 now, about the, the dominion and stuff. Yeah, yeah okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. The command can be understood, I think, as the command of the Christ consciousness in us to control the natural impulses that we are all subject to and to restore our dual nature to a unified harmony. Once you achieve this inner harmony and unity, you won't damage and harm the earth and you won't have a will to have brutal dominion over it. Do you remember where St Paul said that all of nature is groaning and travailing, awaiting the revelation of the sons of the man? Well, it seems to me that the animal kingdom can rise no higher or sink no lower than man's consciousness. Animal life is totally dominated by man's awareness of God, as they have no free will of their own but reflect the free will of man. It is wonderful to hear you, John, a son of man, talk today as you do about the sacredness of all creation. And many, many thanks for that. Okay, Mary. Yeah, maybe I am a bit unfair to the Bible because, like, um, but I'm interpreting it literally. I'm not interpreting it symbolically now or esoterically. I mean, you're coming up with an esoteric reading of what those texts might mean, and, like, that's fine with me. But I'm saying that down the centuries in Europe, in Christian Europe, it has been interpreted very literally. But I think the priests in Jerusalem, whoever wrote that, I mean, they were merely reflecting a kind of, a kind of, a set of assumptions that were already at work in the world. I mean, put it like this, I mean, 70 million years ago, the whales and the dolphins and the porpoises, the sea beasts that we were talking about in the Tacana Capsule story, they were land animals. And they went down into the ocean and down into the abyss in a sense. And they said to the abyss, shape us so that we can be in perfect harmony with our environment. Now, the human beings, we went the other way. We, we shape nature to suit us. They said, shape our bodies, shape us anatomically and psychologically, so that we are in perfect harmony and fit in perfectly with our environment, whereas we want to shape nature. Now, I think that is almost sometimes, I think, Mary, a disastrous way of going, the way of shaping and shaping and shaping and reshaping nature to suit us, to suit us, to suit us, to purely suit human intention and purpose on the earth. And there is, in in India, uh, the subcontinent of India now, the world of Hinduism and Buddhism, there is a lovely story there where, um, I mean, in relation to this, maybe I could tell you, like, uh, about a great Maharaja or a great king one day, he decided like that he wanted to go on a royal progress through his kingdom. And so he told his chief minister, and the tr- chief minister had a huge now task ahead of him because he had to lay down a whole system of roads and by roads and little parts of the by roads so that whichever village uh, his royal person decided he, would, he might visit on any particular day, there would be a road there in, f- in front of him. So vast engineering works were undertaken. And the day was fast approaching, and it began to be very clear to this chief minister that my God, like the system of roads isn't going to be laid down. And um, he went to a lot of people and no one had an answer for him. But then finally someone said, why don't you go to a sage that's living in a forest? Maybe he'd have an answer for you. And he went to the sage in the forest. And the sage, having listened to the story, said, it is your intention, isn't it, that having listened to you, I gather that it's your intention that you wish that his royal person will proceed through his, through his territory without hurting himself. So you're laying down all these roads and uh, roads off-roads and parts of, of, of by-roads. He said, so in order to achieve your aim, you are shaping and transforming nature. Why instead don't you transform his royal person? Why don't you get two strips of le- leather and make a pair of sandals for him? You know, and then he can proceed and walk the great and sacred earth, like, and he won't stub his toes and he won't get thorns in, his royal, in the, soles of his ro- the royal soles of his royal feet. Now, this story is meant to illustrate two ways of approaching of approaching being of being in the world the way of the way of 
the dolphin, if you like, and Tubal Cain. Tubal Cain was the first blacksmith, according to the Bible, like, and he started the tools of shaping nature and the whole Prometheus myth, where we were given the arts and crafts with which to shape nature. Now, the Promethean way or the dolphin's way, I don't know which is the better way. I sometimes think, Mary, that the dolphins and the whales went the better way, you know, that we have gone the disastrous wrong way and that the earth is paying a terrible price now for that. But that's a bigger story now that we can deal with today but I sometimes imagine uh, Prometheus like who stole technological fire for he- from heaven um, like the whales and the dolphins didn't go the way of technology they went into the ocean in which you would have no fire because fire and water don't like so they didn't go the way of t- technological domination of the earth they said shape us and we are shaping the earth without technology which you know we were enabled to uh, invent because fire was brought down from heaven we domesticated fire but I sometimes imagine Prometheus in a grove of Erinys you know in the way that Oedipus ended up in the grove of Erinys and I imagine him like his Erinys would be GNP and turbine and engines like they would have become the whole world of technology would have become in a sense you know his Erinys and they are our Erinys also And when I hear whale song in the ocean, that wonderful Gregorian chant, I wonder sometimes, I only have questions, Mary, I just wonder sometimes, like, about the idea of the transcendence of God, first and foremost, and I still have problems about dominion, and uh, as it's literally interpreted, you know, dominion and subduing the earth and stuff like that, I still have problems about that, but, in its literal interpretation I have, but um, listening to the whales and listening to our own Gregorian chant, you know, I feel maybe that's the way to go, you know, but that is the yearning maybe that is quite beyond um, beyond our reach now. I hope it isn't. I hope that some people can go the way of the whales and the dolphins, like, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all things else shall be added unto you. And Jesus talked about the lily of the field and he said, like, it doesn't weave and it doesn't spin. It doesn't technologically weave and it doesn't technologically spin. And yet it is clad in a greater glory than Solomon, you know, with all his weavers and all his spinners and all his technologies and all our technologies, you know. So there is the Sermon on the Mount way and there is the Dolphin's way, which is the Dolphin's way, and there's Tubal Cain's way. But I take your point, Mary, that these things, and I take it graciously, and, but, um, but, I still have problems like about the way, say, Marxism, Leninism would have interpreted that. I mean, we, we, we imagine that somewhere in our culture and our tradition we have been given permission to do what we're doing to the earth. So time, it seems to me, for the comb of walrus ivory, time for the ghost dance, to dance these dirty devices out of our world. Maybe we could leave that story there, can we? Because time is getting short and we have to move on. Imagine a community of mice and they are very, very busy mice. Busy, busy in the autumn, busy in the winter, busy in the summer, busy in the morning, busy in the afternoon. They are busy. There are always things to be done in, to be, to be done. Berries to be brought in, old berries to be taken out, new food to be brought in, old nests to be taken out, new nests to be brought in. And they're busy, busy. And there's the news at nine, I suppose, the human equivalent of the news at nine and the news at ten and the news at eleven and maybe a different news at twelve and then we start all over again. So busy, busy mice. But among them there's a very odd mouse, a very strange mouse, because every now and again he will stand, he will be seen standing on his hind legs, stretched fully and his ears flared and he will be listening to something and a, a little mouse will come across and say, what are you doing there? And this my this poor mouse will be standing with his ears ears flared he'll say don't you hear it what do you mean what do i hear don't you hear the great roaring and the little busy mouse would say what roaring you're hallucinating there is no roaring will you come down until you be on all fours again and be busy there are things to be done there's all nest to be taken out but little mouse would be all terribly ashamed and embarrassed and he would get down on all fours and he would be busy and other and like all the other mice but again he would he would think of the roaring and again he'd be on his hind legs his ears flared and he would hear the roaring and he'd wonder is it is it is it my own mind i'm hearing or is it something outside of myself i'm hearing and one day not knowing what to do 
when he dropped down onto all fours, instead of being a busy mouse, he, he, he turned and he ran out onto the prairies and he ran and ran and ran and ran and his little heart was pounding and he stood for a while and thinking, Christ, have, have, I really, have I really left home? And he realised he had, but then the only thing to do was run and run and then he looked up and he saw great spots above in the sea, above in the sky circling round in great slow, great movements above in the sky and they were eagles and he knew that each one eagle had great eyes and even the small was trembling in the grass, the smallest movement of the grass they could see, and he was terrified, wondering, "Will I go on? Or will I? Or will I go back?" But he stood, he dared to stand again on his hind legs, and he flared his ears, and he heard the roaring again, and it was a great roaring. And down he he went, and he ran and ran and ran, and he came to a place where the earth seemed to be heaving. Up and down the earth was heaving. My God, he had never seen the like of this. And he went round and climbed a little hill and looked down, and he saw he saw what was a young buffalo, and he said, What a great being. He said, what a great being. I didn't know that such great beings existed. And he was looking into the face of this buffalo. And the buffalo heard the word great being course down through his being, come in through his ears, come in through every pore in his body. He was being addressed as a great being. And this was a sick buffalo, but maybe the buffalo was sick because he was a great being, but he didn't know that he was a great being. But now he had a little being saying, what a great being. And these were like words of healing coursing down through him, out into the tips of his hooves, and out into the tips of his horns and he began to be well and he looked up and he was able to stand up. These were almost words of healing that the little mouse had spoken. He realised he was a great being and he stood up and said, Hello, little mouse, what are you doing out here? And little mouse said, I don't know. Yes, I do know. I sometimes hear a great roaring and I've come out to investigate what it might be. But do you see what's up there? Do you see all them spots? They are all eagles and I'm terrified of them. And Buffalo said, well, now you've helped me and I will help you. I've a plan. I can walk and you can run under me and I will take you as far as the edge of the mountains. So Buffalo started to walk and Little Mouse was under him and four hooves were coming down continually and every time a hoof came down it seemed to shake the earth and Little Mouse thought, Christ, if they come down on top of me I'll be killed and every hoof that came down shook the earth and he was having a rough crossing but his little heart was great fortitude in his heart now and he kept running and running and running and finally the buffalo stopped because the buffalo had come to the edge of the mountain and the buffalo, Little Mouse came out and said... Um, <coughs> said, is this it? And Buffalo said, yes, I can't go any farther because I'm a being of the plains. I'm of the prairies. I have hooves. I'm no good in the mountains. I, I must go back now and find my people. And Little Mouse said, thank you. And um, But Little Mouse said, I was terrified because I thought one of your hooves was going to come down on top of me. And every time you, you stood in the earth or a hoof came down, it shook the earth and the old buffalo looked down at the thing, or this was a young buffalo, but looked down at little mouse and said, you needn't have worried because I walk the earth in the sun dance way and wherever I set a hoof, I don't even injure a blade of grass so that even if my hooves came down on you, you wouldn't be damaged because we buffalo, we walk the earth in the sun dance way. Buffalo and Little Mouse parted and Buffalo, Little Mouse had to climb the hill and he was gone up and he found, he, right there on his path, he found a grey wolf and the grey wolf was very sick. This was a really sick, he was altogether sicker and more ill than the buffalo was. And um, Little Mouse again saw, saw, saw the buffalo, saw, saw, the, saw um, this, this wolf and he said, what a great being. And uh, little, uh, the words again were healing words, and they came down into little. They came down into buff, into the into the wolf, and again they coursed through him and came out to his claws and out to his out to, out out to his little his little whiskers like, and out to the, the ribs in his ears, and again he was healed of it and he said little mouse what are you doing here but this was a blind this was a blind this was a blind wolf too and the, the wolf couldn't couldn't see mouse and little mouse said i am only a little being and you're a great being and i have two eyes and i can give you one of my eyes and one of little mouse's eyes shot out and um they went into wolf and wolf could now see little mouse and said what are you doing here and he says I don't know, but I sometimes hear a great roaring and I've come out to investigate what it might be. And Wolf said, now I have an eye, now I can see with your eye. And I am wonderful.
beautiful on the mountains. Look at my pads. They're not hooves. I've lovely pads and this is my range. So I've a great plan. I will walk up over the mountains and you walk under me and the eagles won't be able to see you then and because you'll be protected by me. So off they went up over the mountains and down the far side and at the far side Wolf said, this is the end of my range now. I don't, I don't know any more. I must go back. And they're part of company. And Little Mouse had found a beaver path. And uh, off he went, thundering down this beaver path, running with all his might, you know, his little heart pounding. And he, he, he stood in the middle of the path and he heard the roaring. And it was a great roaring now. This is a great roaring. It isn't, this isn't a hallucination. This isn't something inside of myself. This is out there and I'm very near this roaring. And then he got down all fours again and he ran and ran and ran and suddenly he tumbled over something, a great bank or something, into a great and mighty river. And he was being carried along by the river. And there was a frog sitting on a rock and the frog sitting half dazed in the noonday on this rock saw a little mouse being carried along by a mighty current in this great medicine river. And the frog saw that the mouse was in trouble and leapt off his rock and down into the river and rescued Little Mouse and brought Little Mouse onto the bank and said, my God, you would have been carried down into the ocean and drowned by that current. This is Medicine River. This is the mighty river. This is Medicine River. Little Mouse had been and fallen into Medicine River and Little Mouse, who had always thought of himself as Little Mouse, was being healed now because he had fallen into the great medicine of Medicine River and a wind came, a kind of whirlwind came and Little Mouse was caught up in the wind and he heard a voice saying hang on to the wind mouse hang on to the wind and little mouse hung on to the wind and it carried him up and up and up and he was becoming a great being because he had fallen into medicine river and the medicine of medicine river had healed him and he was being carried up and up and now he was up where the eagles were and he was gone beyond where the eagles were he was he was gone beyond them <coughs> and he was going through the great sun door into the infinity of the great universe and little mouse who had always thought of himself as a little being turned out to be a great being because even the littlest things in the world are great beings but we don't know the we're great beings and that we have the wonder and the genius of divinity in us and splendor in us and it might be that having gone through the sun door little mouse came back out and came back down to his community of busy busy mice and told them that you too in all your busyness you too in spite of all your business you too are great beings and that there is a medicine river that roaring is a real roaring and every river is a medicine river and every mountain is a medicine mountain and every stone is a medicine stone and every animal is a medicine animal and sometimes like we and every bush is a burning bush and we must get into touch with the medicine that's in the universe. We must become an elk dreamer. We must, like, if someone, when you go out in your, your vision quest in the United, in, among the Native Americans, like, when you reach the age of 14, you get your, 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 your um, if you're a Sioux Indian, say, you get your star blanket and you go out beyond, out into the wilderness, out where you might find your bush soul. You go out into the bush and there maybe your grandfather will dig a vision pit for you and you go down into that pit and you stay there for four days and four nights without food or without water and sometime you're going to fall asleep and you might have a vision and if in the dream or in the vision a bear comes to you then there's every likelihood that you have become what they would call a bear dreamer because the bear has come to you in your vision quest or an elk or a pronghorn or an otter or an eagle whatever sometimes nothing will come uh, no animal no bird nothing will come the person it will be it will be it will be a vision quest that that will have failed in that sense but if an animal comes and gives you a medicine pouch or whatever in your dream or a man, uh, an animal comes and talks to you in your dream, you go back then after your four days and your four nights and you go into the teepee where, your el- where the elders are waiting and they will say, tell us, talk to us about your vision quest and then they will decide whether you are a bear dreamer or an elk dreamer or an otter dreamer or an eagle dreamer and that will mean that you have brought bear, if you dreamed of a bear you have brought bear medicine to your people you have brought elk medicine to your people eagle medicine to your people so like 
medicine everywhere. When the average European stands on the earth in the morning, he sees an economic opportunity. When a native North American Indian stands, he sees big medicine. The earth is big medicine, and everything in it is medicine. Do you know, isn't it a wonderful way of seeing the earth like, and to get in touch with it as medicine? We are destroying the medicines that would heal us. In destroying the earth, we're destroying that which can heal us. Because, like, we have to talk about, to go back to the Old Testament, in Old Testament times, like, and in in the, the biblical vision, is that God is transcendent. God is above and beyond any, any, any sphere that we can imagine. God is out there. Now, in the Greek world, like, the corn was Demeter, the rising corn was Kore, the wheat was Demeter. It was a divine <coughs> earth. Do you know what I mean? It was a divine earth. And, like, if I know that the corn is a goddess and the shooting corn is her daughter, Kore, then, like, when I put a scythe to that, like, this is John Barleycorn or this is Demeter Barleycorn, like, I'm putting a scythe to divinity. Do you know what I mean? So I don't abuse it in the way that I want to abuse the chalice. So I think we have to arrive at a point like when God is transcendent, but God is also imminent, like an imminent divine. In excelsis is down there. You know, Paul de Winter, a few years ago, um, he he had a mass in St. John the Divine Church in in Manhattan and um, this great Anglican church, a big shipwreck of a church, the Lord save us, suppose, typically the biggest, the biggest, the biggest cathedral in the world, but it's the biggest but not the most beautiful. But anyway, he had a thing called Missa Gaia. And the lovely thing about this Missa Gaia is that um, the Kyrie eleison, I, I forget which now, but say the Kyrie eleison or the Sanctus will be sung by a whale. Uh, he will have whale voices there, like uh, he, with an alto sax, say he will be imitating the voice of a whale and he will imit the, he has the voice of the loon and the voice of the wolf and when you hear the wolf singing Kyrie Eleison and hear the loon singing the Sanctus or hearing you know um, hearing whatever else like an elk or whatever it is like you know Christ you say Missa Gaia the earth mass like here everything is brought in from the cold, and not they? You know, we all share the one vast. And just to hear wolves and whales singing the parts of the Mass is so marvellous. So, Missa Gaia, isn't it a great idea? Like, I mean, that the whale is, I mean... Christopher was saying a while ago, like the, when St. Francis of Assisi called, said brother sun and sister moon, in relation to them, he would say that I am the little brother, like they are the great brother. I am the little brother, like, you know. And so Missa Gaia, the place where the Buddha had enlightenment, is called, they've built a temple there now, and they've called it Bud Gaya, G-A-Y-A, B-U-D-D, which is the word for enlightenment, you know, Bud, Buddhi. That's, so Bud Gaya is the place where, and it's restored now by the Thais and the Cambodians restored it there some time ago. So that's Bud Gaya. Why don't we call the earth Bud Gaya? Do you know what I mean? That it is an enlightenment earth. Do you know what I mean? Or if it isn't already enlightenment, it will one day be enlightenment. It will one day be enlightenment. So, Missa Gaia and Bud Gaia, why not? I mean, and then like Christmas night, when I go over to the stall, do you know, I won't say that human beings are alone in their story. I won't have to, I won't have to be experiencing the, t- the, the awful, the awful desolation of us and them. You know, so, maybe our mass has to become a Missa Gaia, and when we walk the earth, we must know and believe that we are walking in Bud Gaia. In the pseudo history of Ireland, they call it, they talk about several peoples, different peoples coming to Ireland. The first people who came was Kesser, she was a woman and she had her 50, <laughs> her 50 with her, but that was before the flood. And then came, uh, wasn't it, Partholone and his people, and then came. Nemed and his people, and then came the Thuadhanon and the Firbolog, the Firbolog and the Thuadhanon and the Celts, and then came the English, the Normans and the English, like, and people are still coming, you know. Now, when the Thuadhanon came, 
they came from Inchatushka Triv and Darwin, you know, they came from the northern islands of the world, you know. They were the people of the goddess Danu and they came in a great magical cloud, uh, you know, to the mountains of Conmacnare in, in Connacht. And they brought four great treasures from Inchatushka Triv and Darwin. They brought four great treasures with them. They brought the Dyda's Cauldron, do you remember the Dyda's Cauldron? They brought the sword, the spear of Lu, um, the sword of Nuada and the Lea Foil. Now, I imagine sometimes, I, I imagine sometimes, a new part alone, another part alone, coming to Ireland, you know, and he's coming to a land in which there are no people yet, you know, because the people who came before him have gone. They came and they went. So he's coming to a pristine land, and he brings a great treasure to Ireland. What he brings to Ireland is a Navajo cradle. Can I just speak to you now that Navajo cradle? This is a man, a Navajo, making a cradle for his child. A Navajo cradle is different from our cradle, but it is still a cradle. I have made a cradle boat for you, my child. May you grow to a great old age. Of the sun's rays I made the back. Of black clouds I have made the blanket. Of rainbow I have made the bow. Of sunbeams have I made the side loops. Of lightning have I made the lacings. Of river mirrorings have I made the footboard. Of dawn have I made the covering. Of light on high horizons have I made the bed. Can I read that just once more? I have made a cradle boat for you, my child. May you grow to a great old age. Of the sun's rays I made the back, of black clouds I have made the blanket, of rainbow I have made the bow, of sunbeams I have made the side loops, of lightnings have I made the lacings, of river mirrorings have I made the footboard, of dawn have I made the covering, of light on high horizons have I made the bed. This is a cradle that all of us need. And no matter what age we are, young or old, male or female, it is, I think, a cradle we should all be willing to lie down into. We'll be lie down, lying down into great creative nature, lying down into the genius of the universe. In this cradle, we can receive and experience ecological second birth. We, the Europeans, who think of ourselves as belonging to the first world and look upon the Navajo, as belonging in the third world, well, I suppose it sometimes appeals to me that we are living in a spiritual third world and instead of having pot-bellied bellies, we have pot-bellied hearts and pot-bellied minds because we aren't being nourished any longer by our culture, we aren't being spiritually nourished and our seals' breathing holes have closed over. Think of this whole evening as a journey to this Navajo cradle, a cradle we might all lie down in and be born again in, the cradle in which Europa might lie in, the cradle in which Kathleen, the daughter of Hulan, might lie in, the cradle in which each and every one of us might lie in and be born again. God bless the first peoples of the world. If we are willing to listen to them, then we might, listening to them, learn to stand and to walk beautifully on the earth, reborn from this Navajo cradle.